Welcome to the Pavillon de l'Arsenal. I'm Marion Mallard, the director of this uh, Pavillon de l'Arsenal. I'm delighted to welcome this event with uh, the Hermes Foundation. As you know, it is an event dedicated to the stone, and Pavillon de l'Arsenal is the center of urban planning and architecture in Paris and has been studying the issue of materials for a long time, and I think it is the first time that we have architects invited uh, to this event. This is why we're delighted to welcome this event, because within the Pavillon de l'Arsenal, we think it is important to uh, look at the return, uh, look at the use, uh, the renewed use of materials such as uh, wood, earth. Uh, we had previously an exhibition on the stone, and I am uh, delighted uh, to um, welcome this event with uh, Lina Gautme, who has uh, built with stone. Thank you uh, for your presence today. And I take this opportunity to say a few words on the exhibition, which is in the pavilion on the first floor, which is called Paris Animal, Paris Animals. Uh, um, and uh, it is about living organism, organisms, and I invite you to visit it after this conference. Lina Gautme, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much, Marion. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you for this third matinal morning session. I can see familiar faces. Thank you for coming back. Uh, thank you to Marion to welcoming us in this very beautiful place uh, uh, which uh, addresses issues such as the environment, living organi organisms. This is a great source of inspiration. This matinal morning session is dedicated to building, to construction, and we will see construction through stone, whether it is the removal of stones or uh, uh, the accumulation of stone to build. Today I'm also delighted to be on the uh, other side of um, the stage uh, um, for once. So we will start with uh, Laila Neme, who is a director of research at the National Center of Scientific Research. She's also an archaeologist and an epigraphist. She will talk about the stone. We will travel with her presentation. Her presentation is called Nabataean Architecture or the Art of Quarrying Stone. You have the floor, Leila Nemi. I'm happy to be here today because this is a place dedicated to architecture. I'm an archaeologist and not an architect, but architects for me uh, are my counterparts because I invented a definition of archaeology. Uh, which is my own interpretation, but it creates a link with architecture. For me, archaeologists are architects of deconstruction. Well, simply because instead of building, they uh, unbuild, and in doing so, they uh, get information um, on uh, sites. Two or three years ago, uh, with this work, I uh, was awarded an architecture a price, uh, and as an archaeologist, it was a real pleasure to be awarded, to receive an award from architects. <coughs> I will start with this slide. Uh, looking back at the title, my apologies. So why the art of quarrying stones? Well, simply because Nabataeans, the Nabataeans were builders, but builders that use two main uh, construction techniques. The first one being traditional of masonry, of construction with masonry, and the second being a rock uh, building which extracts material in a natural environment to uh, make a monument out of it. I chose this slide to illustrate this because on the left you have an Abatean tomb, which is incomplete, and on the right, right sorry, you have the relief, uh, 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 the natural environment, so to speak. So it is an art of subtracting or extracting the stone. 
So I will divide this presentation in three parts. First of all, what type of stone, where and when, an integrated stone economy, and then both modest and monumental uh, achievements. I wanted to start with some beautiful images because Nabataean sites, the most renowned ones, are, in, are extremely beautiful and I was fortunate to work with a photographer, a friend of mine, Hubert Hague, who made very beautiful photographs of this site on which I've been working for 21 years at, in, it is north of Alula, which is uh, not Egra, and I could not resist the pleasure of showing you a few uh, vistas of this magnificent site and this material on which I will uh, build on my presentation. So this is not Petra. Uh, here you have an image of Petra, the, ne the royal necropolis. Petra having rock Nabataean uh, monuments, the largest ones and the most elaborate ones, so sophisticated ones, then obviously we can discuss whether they are the most beautiful or not, but they are the largest ones, largest ones, and they are well kept as well. Regarding the issue of materials, what type of stone, where and when, the Nabataeans on all sites where they constructed monuments, erected monuments, they worked with sandstone. And this sandstone has different uh, qualities, different, there are different types of sandstones, or Ovidicins, Cambrian sandstone, sandstone coming from Petra with uh, different colors and textures and di different uh, type of pebbles, uh, types of solidity, hardness and abrasive characteristics that are more or less uh, important. Uh, first of all, Ordovician sandstone. Here you have the period. I never remember uh, those numbers. That's why I've put them on the slide, but it's very old indeed. You have Cambrian sandstone and Ordovician sandstone here. And the difference between the white sandstone and red sandstone is very important, the white ones being less uh, robust. I also like these images, um, these pictures, they are particularly aesthetic. I don't know what it uh, makes you think of, but for me, it brings up uh, pieces of meat. <laughs> it's not very poetic. <laughs> And uh, I hope that you see something else in, in, in those images. But looking at the white and red and those motifs, uh, uh, they are very beautiful indeed. And when you look at the stone up close, you can truly see those details, those phenomena. And the name, Semitic uh, uh, name of Petra, the ancient city, uh, the Nabataeans called it uh, Rechem the uh, variegated stone. And indeed, those stones were very colorful. It had advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, I don't have the time to detail all of that, but it's a soft stone, a sedimentary stone, which uh, suffers a phenomenon of erosion, water with runoff, uh, and uh, erosion through wind, and also the saline um, overswell, overswells. And through the evaporation of water coming out of the ground, the salt uh, is uh, um, um, having an effect of erosion on the stone. And stone masons anticipated this uh, phenomenon and uh, <coughs> erected those tombs above the ground to avoid uh, um, the buildings to be um, impacted by this salt. So here you see the irregularities of the stone, of these constructions. You see the veins, quartz veins, on an incomplete uh, building in Egra, 
All these, uh, all these phenomena were um, <coughs> a source of disturbance uh, for stonemasons. You see the natural profile of the rock, and stonemasons didn't know uh, the extension of these irreg irregularities inside. Um, <coughs> In, uh, next to Alula, uh, next to Egras, um, there is a project to build a hotel which is entirely uh, uh, carved into the stone with wells, uh, with lifts. This is a new construction by Jean Nouvel, and Jean Nouvel came to Egra to discuss this project with me. He will, have, uh, he will encounter such difficulties. So <coughs> I was wondering where the stones are. So for Nabataeans, the Nabataeans, we are in the Near East, of course, and it stretches from Damas to Hijaz, naming this mountainous region of the north uh, east of Arabia, Petra being the capital and the site of Egra being an important Nabataean site. So all of the Nabataean sites have not delivered rock architecture. Uh, on the left, you can see two main sites. I've mentioned them several times, Petra and Egra, but you also have other types of uh, sites, Wadiham, El Dissa, or El Bada, which uh, uh, have a, 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 a lesser number of rock uh, monuments. So you have the uh, Aldisa tomb, there's only one, they didn't have enough resources, it is incomplete, but it is a signature to create a Nabataean tomb. Wadiram, you have a few niches, uh, beetles, and you have the Albad uh, tomb. Uh, this sandstone is very specific, it's more coarse uh, compared to Egra or Petra, and the monuments are less sophisticated, uh, less refined. So the finesse of uh, the sandstone uh, allows uh, uh, stonemasons to uh, create uh, very detailed motives. Second question. Well, I'm not going to give you... Uh, an exhaustive timeline of the Nabataean kingdom, but they, it starts before Christ all the way to the second century after Christ. What you need to keep in mind is that the reign of the most prestigious king, the, the reign during which the major Nabataean uh, monuments were erected, is that of Aretas IV, uh, called the king that, who loves his people. And he is, he reigned 2,000 years ago, roughly. So let, now let's talk about my second point, the integrated stone economy. You'll understand why I'm saying that. You see that you have quarries here, one which is uh, shell-shaped, uh, another one which is... Uh, here at the bottom of a mountain range and as an archaeologist you see the uh, imprint of the wedges that were used to extract the blocks from these quarries and these were metal wedges. You can see here some views of these quarries and by showing this slide I wanted to show that with regards to stone cutting, all my knowledge, I owe it to Jean-Claude Bessac, who was a stone cutter. He worked at CNRS for many years. He retired, but I started working with him as early as 1999. We uh, worked on all uncompleted uh, monuments in Petra, the two of us, and he wrote a book on stone cutting in Petra. And that has become a Bible, a reference book on stone cutting in this part of the world. And everything I learned, I know, in, I know that from him. And of course, I do have personal interest in technical work and, and uh, craft work. And one of my dreams would be to start cutting and carving stone myself. I've never done it, uh, but when you work on a site, that's something you can't do. 
So why am I talking about a fully integrated economy? Well, because the tombs, when they were built, were processed as a quarry. And you can see here that the lower part of the tomb is processed as a quarry with blocks that are separated by rigs and that were used then as construction materials. So it's a fully integrated economy because part of the material that's removed from the stone, from, from, the, from, from the mountain, is also used as construction material. That's the same case here. You can see blocks that are ready to be removed and that are standing in front of the tomb. And then you have uh, all the other monuments built in masonry and for that, a lot of construction material was required. Hence, all these uh, quarries, which you can't see when you visit Petra, but that are located close enough. And then in Egra, they needed to consolidate the wells. And it was an oasis that was uh, um, built on a, on a water table. And we found 300... Uh, um, wells that were lined afterwards and you can see that here uh, this is um, from the antique uh, times and you can see that some blocks have been reused these are blocks that were taken from an arch construction and that were then reused recycled to line up the well when these um, uh, wells were back into service in the 70s thanks to mechanical pumps. So how did these guys cut the stones and did they start from the top or the bottom? Well, all tombs were built from the top to begin with. So the first task of stone cutters was to make sure that they had access at the top of the mountain where they decided to build a, to a tomb. And from there, they were moving all the way down. And this is what we can see in these uncompleted tubes. And you can see that here. And if I'm not mistaken, I now have a short video that I wanted to show you. It was made by Opixido for the Enula exhibition that was organized in Paris in 2019. And I was a co-curator of this exhibition. So you see they start from the top. As I said, sandstone suffers from water. So the first thing they do is they create a small draining, drainage channel, so to speak, to collect runoff water and bypass it to the side of the, of the mountain so that water doesn't uh, drip on the facade of the tomb. Then they use each Platform, okay, there are a few mistakes on the video, but it doesn't matter. There are a few mistakes. But for each step, they have a plateau, which they use as natural scaffolding. And you see, they've also uh, dug some holes in the wall so that they can climb up, and they, they, they make sure that there is nothing that falls from the top back on them. So every level was fully completed before they moved to the next step. Why? The principle was they didn't want to go back there. And when stonecutters were leaving the site, as you've seen the, this man going up, they were using the, the, the site uh, access to get out and, and go away. So you see that the tombs are built from top to bottom. The inside is something a bit different because in order to dig a gallery using the tools that they had available back in the days, it was difficult for them to dig from bottom to top. So they had to dig galleries and then come back. The funny thing is that in Petra, for instance, you see chambers in the tombs with ceiling heights which are much higher than the height of the door. Why? Because these were prestigious 
tombs for the king and their burial chamber needed to be prestigious and very high, which made it necessary for, for the quarry workers to build a much larger number of side galleries. In Agra, none of the burial chamber has a ceiling which is be above the highest level of the door, which makes it very much easier because the, the, the door gives access straight to the gallery and when they get to the door they can go to the gallery and then move forward. Inside the tombs, they didn't use so much of the material that they extracted from these uh, uh, chambers. We've noticed that the two the upper two-thirds of the chamber were not processed as a quarry. You can see here these prisms, which are quite characteristics of these monuments. And you see that inside you have these blocks ready to be removed, separated by uh, these uh, carved channels. And, of course, inside these chambers, well, that was uh, generating waste that could be used in building walls, for instance, but it, it was difficult for them to work uh, kneeling on the ground to extract significant blocks so that it's only the two lower stories that were processed as quarries so that they could uh, collect materials. Now, talking about tools, there are measuring tools, I'm not going to describe them all. You have the level, the calipers, etc., etc. With regards to the tools, uh, they used the, the um, hammers and the um, and also brooches, uh, scissors, and other mallets. And the peak to the right was. Uh, well, discovered by Jean-Claude Bessac in 1999 in one of the Petra tombs where he worked despite danger. My kids back in the day were three years old, so I said, I'm not taking the risk. You, if you want to go there, you go on your own. And if you're not back in three hours' time, I send uh, the, the emergency services. So he went there on his, um, on his own and his foot stumbled on this Nebatian tool, which was a spare tool that had never been used by the workers. As sandstone has a wearing effect on, on tools, most workers had their spare uh, tools. And when they left the, the, the site, they probably forgot this one. And it's nice thinking that it's a stone cutter who found the spare tool of another stone cutter, but 2,000 years later. Okay, so here are the uh, stone cutting techniques, which is probably of interest for people in this room. So you see the difference between what I call functional cutting and ornamental cuttings. Depending on the way the tool is being used, you can have a, a cutting which is pleasant from an aesthetic perspective, others which can be just functional. Here is the difference on the same column between the ornamental cutting to the left and the functional cutting to the right. And you see the difference. The uh, aspect is totally different. Now, functional details. Why am I talking about a functional detail? Well, you see to the left, uh, when it's functional, it's covered uh, with a coating. So why making it aesthetic if it's to be covered with a coating? But having a deep groove allows for the coating to get a better grip. That's why it can be useful. Um, and you look at, look at the inside of the funeral chamber. No one would go back there once you've, in, you've entombed someone, so no use for this to be aesthetic, except for the tomb of a king. And in parts which are not very visible, look, you're on the side 
of an Egyptian prove no interest having a beautiful and aesthetic uh, part uh, cutting on parts which are not visible on the facade. Now, these are the aesthetic cuttings, and these are uh, to be seen, to be seen, and in sites in the Near East where you have light and sunlight, these monuments are very difficult to take in, in pictures because, because of lighting uh, issues. But you can see uh, that these craftsmen were looking to capture the light. You can see here on this vertical ornamental cutting, it's sort of chiseled and it's absolutely beautiful. It's kind of palm, sh palm leaf uh, uh, shaped and it's beautiful. Now, tricks and accidents. I love these details because when you have some knowledge of this uh, type of architecture, you can see that on this tomb, which is, has become a symbol of Higra, it was carved in, in a mountain, but the owner was so so was so proud that he wanted everything to be carved in the same mountain but at one stage he made a mistake so he had to add stones you can see here then there are elements that may have been damaged because one block fell or because the stone cutter made a mistake and you can have uh, various pillars that can be reworked uh, because some stones were broken because of the falling of other stones. And you can see here where everything has been repaired. And as I said, um, you have monumental uh, and modest uh, sites so we talked about tombs and, and, and funeral chambers I'm not going to talk about the different types and typology of uh, tombs and, and funeral chambers if you want me to do so we'll have to take another two hours but that's not the purpose of our conference today and here are the different types of tombs you can find in the Bethian sites in orange here that's the one I'm showing here and you can see how they are uh, built. You have the crown at the top with half uh, plain stones, then you have the Egyptian cornice, then you have uh, the uh, attic, then you have the capital, which is um, a simple version of the Corinthians ones, and to the right you have a sketch that we published in 2015 a, in a book called the Egra, a tomb, the Egra Tombs. This book is 900 pages long, by the way, and it took a lot of work from me. And there are various articles from uh, many of my colleagues. And for each of the tombs, there is a systematic description of the uh, cutting traces of the various tools that were used. It was published at the Académie de Belles Lettres. I get no copyrights, by the way, but that's a beautiful reference book. Because what I wanted to show you here is that, as I showed on my first slides, all these buildings are made with a stacking up of different elements. And the architectural formation of these tombs is the result of the stacking up of various parts according to proportions that need to be uh, complied with. So you need to be able to read the monument because the proportions have been respected proportion of the height of the different large stones, large stones with regards to the rest, the, their distance from one another. All these elements are very important. And then there are more modest um, constructions like these betil uh, 
buildings, better being the uh, divine representation in the Nabathean uh, religion. These are standing stones. They're not very high in height, one meter. There are lots of them in Petra, but also in Hegra. So you see here, for instance, two betils, similar size. So these are gods. Then there are banquet rooms. Nabathians were loved banquet rooms. This is where they would uh, get together in groups of 13 with uh, musicians in order to share meals. Or you can see here water tanks uh, carved in a rock. Uh, that's for the collection of water, of runoff water. It's quite a sophisticated system that works very well. You also have uh, the grape crushing tank. You have uh, access to so many uh, venues and you have houses. You probably can't see very well, but the small halls to the left are houses that open onto a terrace where you have monuments being built. So, okay, that's the book I was uh, uh, talking to you about. And you have a picture of Jean-Claude Bessac's book on the work on stone in Petra, which is a Bible for those having an interest in stone cutting in the Nabatean uh, society. And that's me trying to carve stone in a school uh, in, called Madrid Sedira, which is a school that trains women mostly to these uh, crafts works. So I tried, but that's all I did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, welcome our next speaker, Carl Frederick Benson, and uh, to talk about construction rather than the removal of stone. Carl Frederick studied in the United States. Uh, he traveled extensively. Uh, you have different backgrounds, and your practice, uh, you have your architectural practice in Paris since the year 2000. You work a lot with stones. I don't know if it is a coincidence, but you will tell us about your background and you've received number, numerous awards uh, for your stone, stone constructions and that's uh, wonderful. How do you see, uh, after looking at the Nabataeans uh, who removed the stone and uh, seeing at, uh, comparing that to what you're doing, you're moving mountains, uh, so to speak, to uh, create your projects out of uh, stone? Uh, and why today are you working with such material? Well, thank you, first of all, for your invitation, and good morning. I've appreciated the, the end of this uh, presentation, which ends with the human aspect uh, of stone uh, uh, construction. It's a very direct link with the work of uh, uh, architecture because it is for humans, it is about culture. Yes, the stone uh, was a discovery for me. I spent a lot of time in my life in, in France, even though I come from Sweden and from North America. And when I worked in the south of France, I had to conduct different projects, and it seemed uh, um, obvious for me to use the natural, naturally occurring material, which was stone. I didn't think at the time that it could be used as a, a building material. Maybe you are uh, convinced of that here in this room, but at the beginning we thought we cannot build cities with stones, but if we look around us, uh, um, a lot of cities are made out of stone, so it seemed obvious to do that, and it was indeed uh, possible to do it. Coming back to the previous image, I wanted to start with this. We talked about moving mountains. It is both the idea of building with stones, and you take a material and you move it. And through this, 
you, it, it is architecture in itself. It is the making of architecture. So here you have the mountain, it's a quarry in the Luberon with which we worked. Um, and uh, uh, you have the mountain and the scale is quite incredible. It's 15 meters high, this doorway in south of the mountain, that's their office <laughs> building. And on the right, you see the, the block, the extraction of blocks of stone. And uh, uh, it, it's like a Nebatian uh, site, but elsewhere in the world. You also have a staircase. Uh, you can see it on this picture, which stops at uh, 10 meters of height because they dug into the uh, stone. It's very interesting because when you visit those quarries, I've done so. Uh, uh, recently, and we wonder what happens with quarries afterwards. There's a specific legislation that says that we need to put them back in their original state. So we need to rethink about uh, the future of uh, quarries, uh, uh, how can they become a, a sort of architectural um, structure. It's interesting to see it that, that way. We would need to move mountains the other way around. So this is the first uh, major project I had to uh, sketch. Uh, it is a winery uh, in Draguignan, in the south of France. And here I wanted to do just that, to move blocks from the quarry and to have fun in uh, stacking them up in different ways and to try to come up with something interesting. And the scale of the building is quite uh, important. It's 100, 100 meter long, and the facade is 11 meters high, nine meters of stone at the end. And we wanted stone, well, on one side to, if we come back to the human uh, aspect, we have a human building in a landscape, so you need it to be visible, to, to really... Uh, build a presence. Here we have very mathematical um, shapes, form. I, I like the simplicity. These blocks are one a meter times one meter times uh, um, half a meter, but this is a human uh, scale when you close to that building, you want to touch it. It's uh, central in a way, and it is a structural facade. It, uh, it is a load-bearing uh, um, uh, facade. Inside of the building, these are very large rooms, and at the time, we thought it would be easier to do it with concrete, so inside you have uh, some concrete, and it's quite magical to see the assembly of these stone <coughs> elements which barely touch uh, each other. You have a secret, uh, <laughs> yes, there is indeed a, a manufacturing secret here that I can share with you <laughs> willingly. So uh, I, I'm, I'm self-taught when it comes to using stone and uh, all of the information I've collected uh, is from stone experts and I've asked them what are the rules and they've said, well, the only thing that matters is when you set a stone on top of another, you need 25 centimeters uh, uh, of setting for it to be, to, to hold, to be self-standing. So uh, um, it, it works. And when you have a, an expansion of these uh, walls, uh, if you want something more light, to, to make this building more light, when there's too much spacing for seismic reasons, uh, you have earthquakes in this area, in this region, so you have two metal pins or, or 
nails in a way which prevent the stones from sliding from one way to another so they are just glued uh, in, in a way so this is a seismic uh, area okay so we really feel that lightness with this building this construction and I can see uh, stone masons workers or these uh, craftsmen that are stacking up the, the stones the blocks of stone they, they need a specific uh, expertise, savoir-faire. Yes, indeed. Um, you have mainly the, the, the guy on the left and the one on top, that's the father. It's a father and a son working t together and they have worked with me on several projects. These are two craftsmen, two uh, stonemasons uh, who belong to a guild. And they've worked on this project and a project I will present uh, later on. So it is ma a manual work. So does it mean that it, it takes longer because it is manual? Well, for this building, it's one, more than 100 uh, meter long and 30 meter wide. They, it took them three months and a half to do everything. So it's not bad for two people. Not bad indeed. So it shows that, uh, well, using digital teal tools, uh, it can be possible to move forward very quickly. Well, this one is not um, using any digital tools. I'm an old school guy. And I learned... I was in school when you still had uh, standard records that, and not CD or digital files for music. So I learned without digital technologies and I learned from my masters that you have to offset the stones by so many centimeters for them to stand. It's not complicated. Okay, so that's the landscape. It's a wine growing area. Yeah, and this is why my first projects were in wineries. And I wanted to show you the landscape around that because it's directly inspired from the landscape. I, I realized that afterwards, but of course, there is a connection with the terrace plantation of, of vines in this part of the country. And there was the existing building and the garden that we worked on as well and the idea of having large and functional buildings next to this beautiful house well we wanted this to be prestigious but let's face it it was the factory it was the warehouse it was a highly technical building and having it standing in the middle of a city next to a beautiful garden well the idea was to make it disappear behind the wall of garden, and that's the wall of garden, which is a bit like textile that uh, deploys with lots of curvy lines in front of the garden. Yes, and this wall is uh, seven meters in high and 80 meters in length, so it's quite a large wall. And we wanted to give it this quality you probably can't see right away but it has to have uh, to be a sensuous wall that's inviting uh, the uh, curvy lines create different spaces inside yes and with the architecture of this building there is a, a, a relationship where you have wine you have stone and where you have stone you have wine so are you moving the mountains from far away or are you using local resources what kind of stone have you used for this building for instance well this is stone that comes from the from a Luberon uh, quarry which is located an hour and a half from from the winery if you remember the picture of the mountain with the gate to the mountain, all I did was, was copying, really. Well, it's when you copy that you learn. You're right, you're right. So it's the mountain that's um, moved and, and rebuilt differently. Then there is um, a visit gangway, because they have visitors, 
And on this, on this gangway, you can have natural way, uh, light, because the, the, the wall is used as a reflection surface to bring in natural light. But it also protects the wine, because you can't have light on wine. So it provides protection to the inside, and it also helps regulating temperature, I guess. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because on such buildings you need to have a thermal inertia. Yeah, stone is perfect for wine. Stone breathes, it maintains uh, the uh, temperature to stable level. And it's a buffer zone that protects the uh, winery, which is just behind, and they're protected from uh, temperature variations. Okay. Now we can see big machines that are used on the stone. Why do you use them? Well, that's very funny because I really resisted using machines and robots. I felt it would be too expensive. And there again, this project was sketched by hand through a computer software, but it was not programmed. Then we did program for, to make adjustments so we worked with uh, some of the engineers who were present in the room. So I have to be careful and pay tribute to their work as well. But uh, the um, stonemason, the stone cutter, we, we talked quite a lot. And I really resisted the use of robots. But he was the one who told me and convinced me that uh, the finishing of large blocks with robots and each stone is different, really. There is not one stone that's the same uh, 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 as another. And it's with the robot that you can make the small adjustments. So you have this 3D mock-up that is um, worked out by the engineers. And then it moves to the stone cutter. And everything is entered in the, in, in the robot program. And that's how the stones are finished. So it's the stone cutter who decided to go for uh, uh, robot-assisted machining of the stones. Absolutely. So here you have uh, this uh, assembly of four stones uh, in one block. Is it a way to make construction more efficient? And was it a suggestion from your stonemason? Absolutely, absolutely. I had an empirical idea. How can we work? We'll have uh, individual blocks that we will uh, superimpose on top of one of the other. And he said, no, come on. If we have four of these blocks in just one piece, well, it's faster. And we can lay them out in a certain way so that they can hold. And he convinced me. And there are secrets of constructions which you cannot see here, but this wall is continuous. But for each strata of stone, you have grooves with cables that connect the, the wall over its length. And every three meters, you have cables that go from top to bottom and which are anchored in the foundations to maintain the wall in its anchored position. And so you have uh, all the scaffolding around the stone, so to speak, and it's bolted in the foundations. And so it's kind of a structural meshing made of iron, you use less iron than in concrete, but it helps your walls stand up, absolutely. And what I found very interesting is that there was a dialogue between you, between um, construction workers, stone cutters, stone masons. Is this dialogue helpful to, to refine the project and possibly change it and change your approach to the project? Well, here, the sketch has not changed a lot, but the way it was implemented, uh, 
I mean, that required another level of expertise and that was achieved through a dialogue with uh, real professionals in that field. Okay, so this dialogue becomes very important then and the implementation of the resource is also important. And earlier, when we had another conversation, you were, I realized that I was, you said, I realized that I was too accurate in my sketching of the project and that it was useless because stonemasons came in and when they came in, they changed everything and I had to be adaptable and flexible when it comes to implementation. Yes, I believe that uh, architects who discover stones, like I did, have an obsession for sketching. They want to sketch every single block and decide where they would fit. Okay, we can do that. But obviously we have to realize that we don't have the same level of expertise as stonemasons. So we need to have this dialogue. And I was telling you an anecdote about another project that I'm going to show you now. I'd done everything right. I was a perfect student. Everything had been calculated. Each stone block was coming out of the quarry, perfectly calculated. And all of a sudden, we have this stone that comes on the work side, two centimeters too long. My goodness, what am I going to do? I was, I was really upset. And that's when the uh, masons and, and companions came to me and, and they were laughing. And they, and they came to me and they said, and they came with a handsaw and they sawed off the two centimeters. And they looked at me and they said, okay, sort it out. And that's when I realized, okay, cutting stone is not all that complicated. And you can work with blocks which should not perfectly square. So that's what led to this project because if you can cut stone, maybe you can stack up cubes and maybe you can have a bit of fun. Okay, so on this project, that's when your contractor said, we're no longer going to build in stone and at the end of the day you did. Well, that's the building which is just opposite the wall you saw and it's the same project owner for both wineries. And when I brought this drawing of a curved wall, he said, hey, that's great, but you're not gonna build it in stone again, are you? So we came up with many other solutions and at the end I said, look, if we build it in stone, that's going to be building something that's going to be unique, that no one else has done, and he was convinced. And he said he was convinced that this was different enough. And that's another project, that's the, the shop where they sell uh, wine and it was all in stone around, so this one is in stone. And that's a future project. And that's a very powerful ambition to build everything in stone with the floor, the arches, how is it possible? Well, we'll see if it's possible first. It's a winemaker who produces a beautiful wine, still in Luberon. And he's a friend of my uh, stonemason, stone cutter. So he took me, he asked me to work with him because he'd already built a stone a winery where mycelium is growing. Mycelium is kind of a fungus that grows on the walls, but to him that's a very good sign because it's a good sign of good hygrometry and temperature and everything. So we worked with a stone cutter and, with the, and also with the winemaker. So it's four of us working together. We came up with um, crazy drawings and sketches, but we reinvented Roman architecture. I hope that's kind of an innovation at one stage, 
But, you know, it's kind of weird to realize that you've reinvented Roman architecture. So it's the project owner that was close to your stone cutters and stone masons and uh, decided to start building everything in stone. Yes, and we will even try and build the foundations with stones, which is quite complicated from a regulatory perspective. Okay, now talking about stone and regulation, in the program dedicated to wine, does it make it easier as opposed to a housing building that would be built in Paris? I know that amongst our academ uh, academicians, some of them have built uh, buildings, uh, stone buildings, but sometimes they had to face obstacles. What with another project, I realized that building in stone in Paris is far more expensive. Why? Well, fewer quarries, less competitors. Everybody wants to build in stone at the moment. That's something I'm discovering it right now because in the south of France, it's quite easy. And a winery, well, you don't need uh, insulation, you don't need to make all the mandatory calculations that you have to make for safety reasons in a housing building. And unfortunately, stone is not yet well understood as having an interest. Even though everybody sees the interest, it's not yet something which, is, uh, which ranks very high when it comes to carbon car capture. It's ranked as concrete when we know that the performance of stone is much higher than that of concrete. Yeah, if memory serves me right, the carbon emission of stones is uh, a thousand times less than that of concrete. Of course, you have to bring the stone in, but then the life cycle of the material is far better and it can last a few thousands of years. Okay, so for this project, what was the project? Well, we worked on this for two years, but unfortunately we won't build this project. It was a, a chateau in Bordeaux, and there were underground quarries on the site where we were going to build. So we wanted to reuse them, and we wanted to open a quarry on the site, extract stones, and then build the walls on the top. So you have a picture here to the right of the existing quarries that we wanted to use to store the wine, and to the left, the building we would have built with the stones we would have carved out from the quarries just underneath. And you see the specific geometry of the building, which is indirectly connected to the geometry of the underground galleries, which you can see here. And in this construction or in the design of your projects, can you say that the mock-up is uh, very important or is it 3D model that's very important? Because when I started and when I went to architect schools, my first project was to build with uh, small uh, lumps of stone and to try and build an arch and make it stand. It was an awful exercise because we would spend hours making the arch stand and then it would all collapse. So is your um, mock-up important? Is it 3D which is important? How are your design tools adapted to stone construction? Okay, so we work on blueprints and 3D models quite a lot. Um, I, I need to see things, so I need to have a 3D model in which I can sort of walk in to look at things. 
And this can also be used by stone cutters and stone masons. And then the physical mock-up, it comes at the end. It's just a confirmation uh, for me, at least. Other people would work differently, but my mock-up is a confirmation of everything I've worked on before. And it leaves a trace. Okay, but we also studied together in the same school of architecture. But do you have this envy to start from available resources, from the material that's available? And are you teaching about using stone when you teach to future architects? I'm quite modest with my pupils, uh, my students. I'd rather they find for themselves what they should use. So I don't talk about stone so much. Perhaps I should do that more, in fact, to talk about stone. So the material is increasingly important in education, in schools, even though we, uh, uh, we were we weren't taught that much about that uh, material, but it's interesting also to think about space and light, and it would be good to accept that stone is a good material to use, that you can make buildings uh, in an intelligent manner, sustainable buildings, and to, uh, instead of doing calculations, carb carbon calculations, to talk about the quality of life, the quality of social spaces, our experiences. Yes, it's a whole in a way. We calculate our carbon footprint and we have a stone. Uh, uh, the, with the stone, it's a material that creates well being in space, in the space. And this is not uh, in contradiction with the carbon footprint of that material. I think in schools, architectural schools, there's a will, even in the United States, uh, there's this idea of starting from the material as a starting point uh, uh, to reflect on a particular project without putting aside the spatial qualities of a project. In this project, for instance, we see an assembly, uh, there's a specific uh, cutting of these large blocks, and, and uh, we stress the, the quality of the material through its size, uh, its monumental aspect. Uh, uh, it gives a, a certain quality to a dwelling. Yeah, this project in particular, Stonehouse, is amazing. With walls, it's easier. You have it's, this is the first project where all the blocks are stacked up. You, you set the wall in this house. There, there is no insulation in the roof. Yes, but not the walls. They're just very thick because it's in the south. It's a summer house, so it works very well without insulation. And when you set a block of stone, uh, you. Work is done, it's wonderful, it's magnificent. There's uh, uh, not that much uh, action uh, going on. So the stone speaks for itself in, in this building. And what about openings that are created through uh, stone cuttings? Or, uh, it's just the spacing between different blocks. Well, here you have uh, holes between the different blocks of stone and then you fill it with a window and that's it. Wonderful. And how do uh, the, the people living in this uh, building uh, uh, own the place? Is there a difference in living in such a space? Did you have a feedback from the users of that building of that dwelling. Well, I was uh, able to sleep in this house and it's wonderful. But it's also quite um, particular on the work site, the work site of this house. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, great to start with. It was 35 degrees uh, Celsius in the Lubero. Our meetings were done there because it was cool. The walls were cool, the stone was still cool.
cool because it was coming out of the quarry, there was some humidity, so you had a sort of morning coolness which was very pleasant. And this was locally sourced, this stone, this particular stone. Yeah, it's, from, it's coming from the Pont du Gard, a bridge in the Gard. It's uh, half an hour away from this site, not even, so it wasn't very difficult to move the stone. So this project seems quite perfect, in fact, but tell us about the difficulties, challenges when you build with stone. Well, stone is a vulnerable material, it's a fragile material. We had some humidity issues with stone. You have to protect it, obviously. For this particular dwelling, when you see the wall uh, uh, in the corridor, you, you cannot guess it, but there are 10 centimeters w which are there to add insulation. This was done before uh, recent standards, uh, um, uh, thermal regulations, recent thermal regulations that were, th they were less restricted restrictive at the time. So just in case it was needed to add insulation, I've allowed for that uh, space, that, that's 10 centimeter for the insulation. But we didn't need to do that in the end because uh, our, the, the end users are really happy with the space as it is. So here this is another project to transform a series of uh, concrete villas and there are other mm, challenges. It's quite complex to make, um, to build houses with all the thermal uh, uh, standards, insulation, regulations. We will double walls from the outside. We will add a stone wall in front of an existing wall which is not insulated. So these are like, uh, uh, these are ovens. We will add uh, an additional stone wall in front and uh, insulation. A part will be entirely removed because it's it is quite in a, it is in a poor uh, state of repair. And what type of thickness are we talking about for the stone wall? What are the thicknesses between the structural uh, stone and the facing stone? What, what, what is what's the si what is the size? I was thinking about 50 centimeters of stone, but now we can we can build. Uh, uh, self-standing walls with 25 centimeters and for the additional wall in front maybe 10 centimeters thick but uh, it's kind of tricky because some of the walls are um, l thicker to, to break those uh, closed blocks uh, these blocks are closed onto themselves, so we're exposing the angles. You have a few hidden cables to have beams and porta In this project, we can see clearly how a stone construction uh, uh, sort of generates a different architectural language. The window is created through just moving, sliding stones leaving the space for the window, it generates a, 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 a void uh, that is filled with the window. That's quite poetic in a way if you go beyond the, the, the assembly of this uh, material. Yes, I don't only build uh, or uh, imagine stone projects, but with specific stone projects, I look at volumes, how will it be built? I can use wood as well. I can use concrete in other projects or steel. What about a stone building? Sometimes uh, uh, we come up with, with, with that idea. I do the opposite, in fact, uh, says Lina. Uh, I, it doesn't seem that you start with form, formal aspects. We start with a program, the spaces we want to create. And with these small villas, small dwellings, it's to have uh, carved uh, uh, cubes. There's a sculptural aspect to it. We, we sculpt or carve spaces. And with stone, uh, uh, in fact, we build differently. You may 
have the impression that you're dealing with a mass and, and that you carve into it, into the stone, and to build a house that gives that impression, well, in fact, it's recreated. Uh, but it, this could be interesting. The most important aspect is to experiment, to try to push the boundaries uh, uh, ever further. And this is a refurbishment project, rehabilitation project uh, with this building. It, it stands out. So the project is structured in a specific way. As I said the other day, as I told you the, the, the other day, Dio Ponte used to say that the past does not exist. He said that we only have the present and the way we look at the past, uh, uh, the existing uh, uh, structure building, and, and then we also have the intuition of the future. Culture is, uh, is uh, simultaneous in a way, brings all of these uh, um, time frames together. So you rely on the past, I like this idea, but you also project yourself as an architect. You invent tomorrow, you inve invent the future. Uh, architectural projects are projected onto the future. So coming back to the history of this building, it's a rune, it was a hunting uh, uh, mansion. It's a lodge, and we wanted to keep uh, the remains uh, of this uh, uh, large uh, the ruins there's also a winery project beside it and we discovered that you only have uh, in Corsica quarries uh, uh, make rubble or small stones you cannot carve large blocks of stone in Corsica so it is built with micro uh, stones uh, uh, dry stones yes we changed the perspective and uh, we, uh, the, the house was built with stones uh, found uh, uh, in the vicinity of the house, so we will change the way we will build the house. Uh, here you also have a project of an urban folly, uh, architectural folly. Um, we have an experiment with vaults. I know that within the academy there are many uh, um, Amateurs of vaults, yes, this is the future of that space. What can we do beside building with large box, blocks or carving uh, mountains? What can we imagine with stone as a material? So we made a proposal for uh, Neuilly to create small pavilions and to have a sort of broken arcade with uh, um, pieces of vaults with a very incredible technique that Amin, who's here with us today, has used in the past. Or, or it is being uh, developed, it's not our invention, and it is to, to create uh, different layers of stone. You have fibers uh, which reinforce the stone. You have three uh, layers of stone which renders it more robust, like a sh the shell of a, of a boat, or, or like a, a bits of eggshells that you throw along uh, the, the boulevard, that's for the shape. And the idea was to really experiment with that technique. So here you have those two bits of stone and, and in between you have the, the fiber which holds the, the whole together. Yes, so it's a vibrated uh, uh, stone and we use bits of stone so we can collect the, the rubble or it can be large blocks. Uh, this is a harder stone, so this is stone that we can use for a counter, for instance, and that's not the case with other buildings uh, which use a softer stones, uh, so uh, uh, obviously that has to be factored in. So let's just uh, conclude this uh, presentation with this project, it's really fascinating. And here uh, it's a different scale, it's not a winery or, or a dwelling. This is another type of uh, project. 
uh, these are data centers. So uh, these are quite functional buildings. Obviously, we're in the digital era now. We've entered that digital era. And here you have stone projects for these data centers. Yeah, in fact, this was a request to study that proposal for data centers in stone. You cannot see it, but uh, uh, see data centers, but we all use them. Obviously, if you have a phone, you use those data centers. So we have to uh, accept that uh, these, are, uh, these exist and that they can uh, be uh, built, imagined differently uh, from a thermal point of view to use stone so they can, they can be sustainable, have more resistance, resilience, and to have other functions perhaps also. So just to conclude, to use stone to build those data centers, uh, this is uh, uh, point 15 of the budget of, of, um, of other types of project. It's a, a drop in the ocean, in fact. Thank you, Frédéric. Our experience at uh, 15th Lac and Well Close, our very first uh, experience, so I'm going to detail um, this, uh, this odyssey. Um, alors. So I, I called I called this um, stone by default. It's because very much what what uh, what Amina has embraced is the, the the fullness of stone and uh, and not selecting the material and uh, very much working with what makes stone so beautiful, which is very much is is sort of uh, fragility as well as strength, but uh, the fact that it's a not an homogeneous material. So um, I, I, I think that's the, the, the big points that people need to understand, especially in, in load-bearing stone structure, is that it only makes sense if everything is used in, in the quarry to, to make, to make the, 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 the building work properly as well as uh, the, the cost uh, part of it. Um, I, I, I articulate it on um, on a, on a, um, uh, on, a, on four ax, uh, four axes. Sorry, I sometimes speak with some uh, French uh, stonemason uh, uh, vocabulary. So the trilithon, um, it's what we started with uh, with Amin when he when he started designing his his, um, his building. Portrait of a portrait of a quarry because each quarry I've got there. Own personality, um, because the way they are, the way the stone is extracted, the one, the way the the, the stone is going to be used. So I, I just want to sort of show some uh, uh, two or three different type of quarries. Then, in the heart of the makers, so in in a way that's the easy bit. Uh, what we find is that the making, the installation, in a way, is something that we've been doing for four. 6,000 years, so we've got a bit of a good basis to start building in stone. Um, case in point with the, uh, with the archaeologue talking earlier. And finally, return to the future, uh, because I'm an 80s, 70s guy, uh, and uh, we should always talk about return, or return to the future. Um, so now, the truly turned a safe base. Uh, what I've done, I, 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 peppered, I peppered something that I called uh, Lithosophie instead of philosophy. Um, I do very crap play on words in French, and they're even worse in English, so I apologize for that. It's, it's coming from my father, unfortunately. Um, so uh, stone is not a luxury, but a commodity. It's very much what uh, we've been trying to do uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, eight years now. Um, and um, I think it's, um, it's very much the ethos of our business as well at the Stone Masonry Company, which is really to make stone affordable uh, through dialogue with the quarries owners and, 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 and engineer to make the, the stone being a, a commodity again. Um, well, when, when I say about the Trilithon, um, I think it's the basis of, in a way, all architecture. Um, it's uh, a, a, the simple beauty of it. Um, here you've got a, a beautiful illustration by good old William Blake. Um, there's all of, it's a good day should always start by a good William Blake uh, poem, which I'm going to give you at least the first line, uh, not the whole poem. Um, so, hold on a second, if Mr. Job allow me to... 
give it to you. Um, so in, in his poem about uh, Jerusalem, he just speak at some points, and did those feet in ancient time walked upon England's mountains green. And I think that's something that, uh, uh, I mean, building is, is about a sort of potency of stone, of really being here, being heavy and embracing this heaviness. Um, and of course, uh, many, many ruins lay around, like these beautiful uh, uh, ruins from uh, Algeria, from the Roman time, um, and uh, which just shows the, the, the magnificence of simplicity of stone. Um, now, um, when talking about stone, and I, I will talk about those quarries a bit later, what's fantastic is that in some area of France, France being, I think, in Europe, well, I mean, we are all between French people here, one of the greatest countries uh, using stone. Um, I mean, Giuseppe, you are just here as an Italian, you, you know the feeling, you do the same when you are in Italy. Um, I know you. Um, so, um, what I mean is, jo joke aside, um, in the 1900s, um, it was already the French uh, saying that, it, in, in a way, a French engineer working on a stone bridge didn't understand and a British engineer with his all little piece of metals that they were putting together. And they, they were really, though the, those engineer architects were saying, you know, France is, is a stone country. And here in Lyon, you've got these beautiful um, uh, First, uh, first couple of floors usually in, in, the, in the old Dion, which are made of local limestone, which are this huge piece of color, this huge piece of stone, which uh, when talking with a local architect in Lyon, you know, you just realize in 1900, the, easy, the easiest way to build was to go at a, at a quarry 100 miles around, uh, away, bring it from the mountain into the river, then unloading it in Lyon, then putting it on a cart with horses, then bringing it on site, and then lifting it up. That was apparently the most logical way. Um, and I, I think we see, we, in a way, we should go back to this logical way. And of course, these, these big columns, they, <clears throat> they illustrate the fact that by knowing the quarry, you can, you can the, the, your architecture should be the result of what's lay in the quarry. Um, on this uh, 1850, I think it's 1860, uh, in fact, uh, a beautiful illustration of, uh, of Lyon being built, um, you, you can see the, 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 this extremely efficient way of building those first floor um, and how tall these buildings were as well. So stone is, is, is very much a relevant material for load bearing. Um, now, something that uh, I just wanted to illustrate very quickly is this sort of disappearance of stone. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's really a, a flyover of thousand years of, of, uh, of stone um, uh, building, but it, it just shows you the slow disappearance of our material from embracing its, its, its heaviness uh, to then making it a pure cladding pieces. Um, and uh, between those two pictures, there is so many other material now in, 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 the 20, in, in our century, which are, need to be allied to stone to, to make it work. So it's, it's a bit, uh, I think, again, we need to take a step back and look at, um, uh, and look how we built now. Um, portrait of a quarry, so here we are. Just looking at time, sorry. Um, so another part of my lithosophy um, is uh, listen to the quarry and draw in its dust your building. So it's by, we, we, what was exciting with, with uh, I mean, is once he started to go into quarries, uh, it just makes sense of the way stone should be using, should, should be used. And I think that's a very important point is architect engineer need to reconnect with material generally, not just stone, but need to go and confront themselves to the material to understand how to use it the most efficiently. Because obviously all of us here, we've been spoiled with a very cheap energy. And now that energy is getting more and more expensive, you suddenly, we all suddenly realize how this is critical to, to, to building, how the cost of energy is critical to building. So, um, quarry number one, uh, I think if, if it was a, a quiz show with uh, some other quarry owners, they would say, oh, I know that one. Um, so I think Carl knows that one very well. Um, it's uh, in Luberon. Um, I, I cannot mimic the, the, the sound of the, 
of the of the crickets just in the back, uh, just on on the pine trees. But uh, there is a sort of stilliness about that quarry. Uh, there is the smell of the pine. There is the, the noise of the machine that's that's mixed with the uh, with the cricket, which is quite something. But um, it is as well a good old quarry, you know, something that has been extracted for ages. Um, you can get very big pieces of stone, it's white, it's a bit of, uh, you know, the good old plain Jane, the, uh, the sort of vanilla stone uh, for, for load-bearing masonry. Um, uh, and that's, you, you, you are going to build those fantastic cellars that, uh, that uh, uh, Frédéric uh, designed. Um, it's the, the very basic load-bearing stone. If you go in Italy, uh, th this will be the Traviata. Huh? That's Botticino, that's hard to get. You know, you've got to sweat, to, 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 to bleed, to go and get that magnificent stone. It's got uh, an amazing, uh, an, an amazing flesh-like um, uh, flesh -like look. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's got cracks. Uh, you've got to, to slumber between these, those cracks. And it, it's a bit, uh, yeah, as I say, it will be, you know, if the first one was vanilla, the second one was with La Traviata. And this one is a shy one, okay? This one is a shy one because you don't see it. Because it's underground. So, you know, again, it's... Uh, very subtle, very shy, doesn't want to make big noise. You know what, uh, every so often you've got those blocks that can come out of the quarry like a, like a bit uh, the, the earth giving birth to, uh, to some new babies. It, it's got this weird, uh, and, and, and again, very, um, uh, very efficient still, even if it's underground, to, 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 build, to, to, build, um, uh, to build with. Th this, this stone, um, so the first pictures is, uh, I couldn't find a st uh, pictures for, the, for that quarry, it's the top of the quarry, is, is, a, is a quarry um, uh, up north, um, and um, that stone has built Paris for the last 600 years. Um, now, um, that's the quarry that we used, uh, I mean, um, again, the specification, the brief that, was, that I mean gave us was to build efficiently, to build Cheaply, I always remember that one, um, <laughs> and and um, and and not caring at all about these final details or these these textures of stone or colors. It was just to be built as efficiently as possible. Um, what's fantastic in this uh, quarry uh, in, in in near Valence in in, um, in Ardèche and Drôme uh, area is um, is that you can get very big blocks, as you can see here. Um, I mean, we'll tell you a bit later how uh, he, he fell in love with all the splitting and all the working and the rawness of the stone. Um, which, if we go back to the Lyon architecture earlier of this big pier, just left uh, very lightly tooled, um, I, I, I do find uh, this sort of block extremely uh, poetic. And. Um, as 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 uh, we we educate uh, we educated at the time, um, I mean, on on the use of stone. Stone is mostly if it's Jurassic. Um, I'm not talking about sandstone. I'm very much talking about limestone. If it's a Jurassic limestone, it's going to be a, a gathering of uh, organic matters at the bottom of the ocean, on, you know, 135 million years or approximately. And um, each quarry, we are going to have a way to. To, to make use of its stone, you know, some, some, some for example, in, in, um, in, in Claire Kenwell, uh, stonemason, sometimes stonemason, British stonemason wonders why we put the, uh, the stone against the grain, you know, not in the bedding. Um, and I tell them that, you know, traditionally in that quarry in France, it was done like that. It, you know, I think again, if you want to build with stone, you need to get your shoes on and just discover the vernacular architecture around because that will give you what you can do or not do with that stone, okay? So again, it's stone masonry is about, and working with stone for architect and engineer is really about learning from, the, from our ancient. Now, um, again, how do you extract stone? So, um, <laughs> it's all very, uh, 
it's all it's all about shock and and grinding. I'm sorry, um, it's a bit uh, uh, <laughs> it's a bit uh, strong. Um, but um, to cut stone, especially hard limestone, um, in the old days, and what we are doing now in very much is was to use a blade with some silicate or some or some sand that you would have put onto the that you would have put on the blade, and the blade would with this with this uh, silicate would would erode the stone and creates that uh, that crack, um, and of course, shock um, with that beautiful uh, pictures of, uh, of, of course, Epstein, the rock driller, uh, which is one of my favorite. Um, you, you, you just have to, to just shock the stone. It's, it's a percussion uh, exercise to make a hole and then to, 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 to put a wedge and, and just uh, split the stone. Now, to come back, someone was asking earlier about the work of women uh, in, 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 um, uh, in, in quarries. Uh, and uh, something that you've got to understand, it was all, uh, there is a, a social element in, in a quarry, and that very much women were in quarries as well as kids, okay? Usually, the job of a, of a small kid was to put the sand into that saw that was going passing like that, and with a, a bucket just putting the saw, uh, the, 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 the sand into, into that crack to, 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 to make the cut. And women were very much used as well in quarries for the polishing and the finishing of, of stone, but again, it's something that is uh, rarely documented. Um, now, so at um, in quarries now, as I say, with what I was saying about the grinding and, and, and eroding stone with, with sand, it's very much what we are doing now. Um, and here you can see a wire that is used in quarries, and you can see the result on the left on the left hand side. That's your left hand side. No, that's your right hand side. Sorry, I'm just always getting confused. Um, so um, on, on the pictures um, on the other side of the wire, um, you can see the, um, the, the, work of the, uh, the work of the wire that has, that has cut through the mountain. You can see as well something that we are going to discuss I mean, later with, with Amin is, is the, the floor. The, the 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 floor the Jurassic floor of the quarry, which is left raw here. It's it's what sometimes people call crust. Um, and I mean, uh, how do I go back? Well, you've got a good memory, so in your in your in your head, you will do that uh, flashback. Uh, but what is interesting is that again, uh, Amin decided to to leave those marks of the fabrication of the making, you know, to avoid this expensive polishing of the stone, because again. If you polish, you are going to use uh, more electricity as well, and it's going to be more costly and less energy efficient. Again, this other grinding that we do at, at quarries is the cutting with a chainsaw, uh, with tang tungsten tools. And again, why would you change? Why would you not show that that uh, that production of stone? Um, why, why won't you show how it's made? Uh, because very much we always enjoy the beauty of the tooling marks on a, um, uh, on, a on a Gothic on a Gothic cathedral. Why won't you? Why like Pouillon and, and others will will not sing the praise of, of the tooling on, on the stone? So uh, that again was something that uh, I mean was keen, and of course the drilling, which is still done, uh, which is not done, of course, uh, like the rock driller from Epstein, but uh, again with new machine and and the splitting has been done for the last six thousand years. So we know one, two, a few things about splitting. Um, and uh, again, on the um, opposite, uh, I mean, and, and Dominic on that picture, you can see the machine, which are drilling the height necessary for, for Amin's building, which again, we did straight away at the quarry. We didn't have to go back to, uh, to, um, to the plant to have it cut at the right measurement. It was done straight at the quarry to again speed up the process and, uh, and designing with those measurements for Amin. Um, and now that was under the watchful eye of uh, Amin and Dominic uh, here on the picture. Uh, which uh, I'm sure that all people who've been on quarries, there is something fantastic when you walk on blocks of stone, on these giant, giant enormous blocks of stone, and you just feel, you know, there is a sort of feeling of, uh, you know, feeling a conqueror on that plinth, which I think I mean really enjoyed on that picture. And maybe he was taking measurements for your plinth uh, in, 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 in uh, Trafalgar Square. Um, in the hand of the makers. I carve, therefore I am. You see, I, I do very crap uh, puns. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I carve before I, therefore I am. Um, the the whole building uh, that uh, I mean will detail has has been carved by I mean shaped by only one man, uh, believe it or not, um, and with those very simple tools um, and. 
I, I, I think that's something that is very important is is the way those those pieces of stone are are shaped by by the hands of uh, men and women. Um, I think they again through an exercise with engineers, uh, we try to simplify the the whole work of that uh, of those lintels and columns. Um, and I think it's very much there. You know, one stone mason, many stones uh, to to carve, and, uh, and a very basic um, basic set of tools. Um, now, the, the storage um, was done at our uh, plant in, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, I mean, it's such a crap setting that I had to put another background uh, because uh, it doesn't make you dream about using stone. Um, and, um, and of course, very much, I, I think what we are going to show and what we are trying to do um, uh, for, for the last 10 years with our company is just to, to prefabricate and, and to do monolithic uh, elements that are easily fitted on site so that you can swap very quickly a precast a, a precast structure a concrete precast structure to uh, a natural stone structure and that's to 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 try to avoid to to avoid scaring too much the, the main contractor no it's not working no you can, can press the button yeah um the the background to um Pierre's yard is actually a Hanson concrete factory. So it's, it's, it's quite ironic. The background that you see on the truck on the right, that's our neighboring building, and that's partly, I, mean, I know I'll get, I, I won't go into too much no, detail no, okay. in our one. But that's one of the, uh, it's not a ch just a challenge about cost and embodied carbon, but it's also an intellectual. That's how we first approached it. That our area, our conservation area in London, conservation area number one in this part of London, uh, uh, since the post-war period uh, has mimicked um, architectural um, uh, um, languages of the past. And what you're looking at is a 1970s structure where apartments are entirely horizontal. It's a steel frame and the brick is obviously, I mean, we, we, we can argue about the proportions and uh, whether it's authentic in its, in its materials as well. But the brick is held up at every floor by a steel frame. So the steel frame is already 30% heavier than it needs to be. And whoever designed it and detailed it as an engineer, as an architect, had forgotten that bricks themselves can hold themselves up as self-supporting skin without having to be load-bearing to, to the structure. So it, it was those initial uh, um, uh, questions that then brought us onto stone. Why is everybody building stone buildings with steel frames or concrete frames and cladding them with veneers? And slowly but surely uh, 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 going onto the load-bearing and then discovering that um, it's, it's other advantages, whether they're cost as well as embodied carbon, which we'll go into later. Um, and and of course, as you can see, those stages of of, of lifting stone, lifting stone are, are are very much the same of lifting any any heavy any any load um, on a site. Um, there's nothing nothing new. Uh, and um, here you can see the piece, and you can see very much on on that picture the lifting of of that piece of crust uh, of Jurassic crust. Um, which, uh, which the last thing that this crust seen was the the, the feet of uh, dinosaurs, um, and uh, I, I think again that's the poesy behind it is that when you look at stone, you look very much at the history of Earth, not not of humanity, far from it, but from Earth, and I think that there is a beauty of suddenly being shown how all these things are made and why, where we are coming from and where we are going as well. Um, so, uh, moving along, uh, here the, um, the, the, those big pieces of stone are, are just um, put back and, and connected uh, via this easy, these big steel uh, con 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 connector plates to the um, uh, to the floor uh, to the floor slabs, and um, you can see the, the checkout uh, the rebate that has been done by the by the by Regis uh, to fit those uh, those boxes. So here we are. You've got the uh, isolation uh, ins insulation plate to avoid the the, the cold bridge, um, and um, and the connectors fitted at the back of the of the stone. Yes. Encore deux minutes, why? Okay, 
right. Um, it's a good thing I didn't start uh, about the story of 135 million years ago. Um, <laughs> so um, something that you shouldn't forget is that uh, with Amin and, and, and our business, uh, you need a, a structural engineer. Um, we all the things we are doing will not be uh, will not be possible without structural engineer. They are a very big part of the whole process. And again, uh, we usually do a, um, a sort of three act uh, with Steve because again, he's, he's key in those development. Return to the future of its failure with your mind and hands sublime it. I do not like to use the stone nobility for stone uh, because I, I think it's, it's a box standard material and it's through us human that we make it, that we sublime it, that we make it something that is above us. And uh, I think for me, it, it, it's key really. Um, what we learn of that uh, of, of the fitting of that uh, structure in, in central London is that because all quarries are not equal, um, sometimes you've got little blocks, and by putting them together with new technology, right, with all new technology like pretensioning, you can make those uh, monolithic. A stereolithic, what we call stereolithic, it's, it's putting stone together uh, and prefabrication. Here you can see our little stone all happy to be, uh, to be put into, uh, into new structural uh, structure. I love that pictures, come on. Huh? Not only am I a good stone mason, I'm a great photographer. And, and I'm humble. Um, so the, the post-tensioning is done, um, the pre-tensioning is done on site, uh, oh, sorry, off site, that's the beauty of it. Uh, as you can see, we produce now on our assembly line, uh, again on, on, on a project by Amin, but we, we firmly believe that pre-assembly is key to the success of re putting back stone together to, on site. I mean, uh, relevant uh, of sites. Um, here you can see the next de de the next portal system that we are uh, working on. You can see uh, a beautiful eight-ton beams, um, uh, eight-ton beams, uh, twelve-ton beams for another project we are working on. And the next generation uh, that will be soon launching of uh, prefabrication of natural stone elements um, that will be used to build maybe not uh, maybe why not uh, uh, rock scrapers uh, another sad pun uh, a rock scraper um, so uh, to, to, to you know to maybe go up to 10, 10, 20 floor um, and build with, uh, with, with, with our magnificent material. We do, of course, staircases. Uh, now, just quickly, because sometimes um, when we were asked about uh, the safety on our buildings, uh, something that was uh, very important is fire resistance, uh, fire, fire resistance, so hence the name Hades do not mess with Gaia, um, is on the, the result of uh, three hours cooking at 900 degrees, uh, six meter long beam, is that it be behave exactly like concrete. So that's the good news. So that's another one for concrete, take that. And finally, um, with, uh, with Amin, um, Amin has been carrying on um, working on, on, on developing more stone, in, um, stone, uh, stone buildings, and we're hoping those will come to fraction. And when you look at this building, uh, another of my uh, litosophy, any stone building is a quarry to be, okay? That is the key thing, is that if you build with thin stone, there is less likely that you are going to reuse this stone, all right? If you build with big, fat, solid stone, there is more chance that this is going to be used and reused and used again, okay? So any stone quarry you see here, you can dismantle Paris, and like uh, Frédéric was saying, move that mountain, newly built, and rebuild another mountain. So here we are, I've done it, thank you. Okay, I'll try not to repeat what you've already heard. Um, so that, 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 that initial um, idea that we um, challenged um, when we were asked to build in stone in this conservation area in, in London, um, uh, we asked ourselves, why is it that most of these structures, in, in, specifically in the UK at least, but I'm sure generally across the planet, tend to be veneers of stone? Is it actually the most structurally sensible thing to do? Is it cheaper? Is it better for its embodied carbon and so on? You ask most structural engineers in the UK and they will say, well, we don't build in stone. We're not taught in stone. Same with the cost consultants. It must be extraordinarily expensive. When was the last time you, you built in stone? Well, I never have. Perhaps that's why nobody ever builds in the stone. So the arguments are constantly circular. So ultimately, we have, we're forced to ask somebody who does know. So Pierre, we got to know Pierre. This is, this is around about 2011 when we first asked those questions on that particular building. 
And that also brings us up to why or why don't we know? And uh, part of the reason that we suggest we don't know is that if you look at somebody like Giorgio Vasari in, in 1540, he's publishing the, the, the most excellent architects, artists, and sculptors. He includes himself amongst them. You have to remember he's an artist and a sculptor and architect himself. But the principal point he's making is that um, w you are educated as an architect, let's stick with the architects, in the materials themselves. So you're, you're an apprentice that learns about the materials, and it's the material and their, and, their, um, and their manipulation, and your particular skill, your idiosyncratic skill, that then allows those innovations to occur. 200 years later, we have Johann Winkelmann. This is the Enlightenment period, and he, he's a, essentially a proto-academic. He is not an artist, he's never been an architect, he's never been in a quarry or used paint or sculpted but he's essentially observer. And the difference between the two is that Winkelmann simply, uh, his, his book is a bestseller because it's the first time there's a clear taxonomy, a timeline of art and architecture across the ancient period. It replaces Vasari uh, on, on the library shelves. But the, the error that it does is, is, is then um, uh, uh, the taxonomy is essentially a collective noun for architecture, for periods of architecture while well, Vasari is very much inter interested in the process. So it's a difference between the process and the product. And teaching from that period onwards, from Winkelmann's period onwards, has been mostly the product, i.e. Uh, we get taught about the appearance and we conflate the appearance um, with, um, with, the, um, with, the, uh, with the architecture uh, and whatever predominant politics we have. Know your materials is ultimately what we're both um, we're, we're both arguing for. Now that doesn't mean necessarily. W I know today is principally about stone, but it's not the elimination of concrete or steel, aluminium, and other materials. Uh, with our, we're learning one project at a time. It's incredibly slow, but we got some postgrads last year to work on a number of buildings that range from airports, skyscrapers. Museums, you know, whether it's Richard Rogers, we talked to that practice, and Zahars, and everybody else, to get all the different building archetypes to say, is it possible to replace the concrete, steel, plasterboard, aluminium, mostly with stone and timber and other embod low embodied carbon materials? We collected all these materials, it's principally the ones they're using in these buildings. There's a lot more, obviously. Rearrange them, and suddenly you, you get a color code like going into a supermarket. You go to the supermarket and you fill your trolley, and before you know it, it's all whiskey and cigars and salami, and you realize, oh, okay, it's all in the red zone. Maybe I should get some green in there. And that's our only question here, really, suggestion, is that you step back, you know your materials, you can design anything you like. It doesn't have to appear like our buildings. So the questions we always get asked, will it look like your building, I mean? No, you can design in any way you like. So that's why we took all the Richard Rogers and Zaha's buildings and we demonstrated it could be exactly the same scheme except built with stone and timber and other materials and less of the concrete and, and, and high embodied carbon materials. What you'll notice there obviously is that timber is carbon sequestrating. Stone the, uh, comes out zero. The only embodied carbon that stone has is in the, in the machining extraction, transportation, and erection on site. So it can be, if you're using diesel equipment, it's 33 kilos of CO2 per cubic meter against something like mild steel, which is 11,000 kilograms of um, CO2 per cubic meter, or reinforced concrete, which is 1,000 uh, uh, kilograms per cubic meter. Now, there are some quarries that are using um, uh, um, uh, 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 solar-powered equipment um, uh, or wind-powered equipment, electrical equipment, which pretty much says your stone is zero because the only embodied carbon there is in the machinery, the replacing the machinery. So stone is going to be something that we're all going to be using, hopefully, in the future, more often than not, if we're allowed to step back and, and, uh, and challenge the, the use of steel and concrete. This is a tower research project we undertook in, in central London for Canary Wharf, so one of the largest developers in the UK. And what you see there is on the far right, all concrete frame. In, uh, the next one in from the right, a steel frame. 
Uh, the one on the far left is everything in stone. So a stone frame, stone floor plates, a stone core. The next one in from the, from the left is a mixture of stone and timber. And our, uh, as architects, we're imagining there's a, a lowering of the embodied carbon. But the amount of timber we use, because we made the floor plates and the internal walls of timber, while the excess skeleton was stone, the core was stone, the total was carbon negative. Now, that is quite remarkable. I mean, essentially, that's what's, what that's telling you is the building is now part of the solution to, 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 to climate change as opposed to part of the problem. So if all of you went away today and said, from now on, all my buildings will be a mixture of stone, and principally stone and timber, yes, you've still got electrical wiring and some aluminium here and there, all of your buildings will be part of the solution. The more you build, the more carbon you're taking out of the atmosphere. The stone's not going to do that, it's the timber. But the stone is doing the replacing of the steel and concrete. It turned out to be cheaper too. So the cheapest version on there this is for a tower, office, typical office tower on Canary Wharf, is the stone and timber version. The stone one is still cheaper than the steel and the concrete version. That's because you're no longer cladding your building. The stone is actually the finish, internally and externally. How do we come across stone? Well, the first project we undertook uh, in stone was just replacing a staircase inside an old building for refurbishment purposes. Uh, but as they did it, because we'd forgotten. How do you build stone staircases? Normally, we're all using steel on concrete stringers. And of course, you find out for thousands of years, it's just stone upon stone upon stone. And it's just what's called a reciprocally loaded structure. So the stone is just resting and sending its load down. Modern technologies allow us to take that CAD model and not waste the stone, because what we're doing is slicing the stone in a certain way that then allows, instead of 50% wastage, the other stone to be used on the counter spiral. While we were in that yard, we were looking at these blocks coming in, thinking, you know, I've just watched somebody, an architect, a friend of mine, his team spend a week, three men, putting tiles on, the, on a steel column to make it look like a stone column. You think, well, surely lifting that in place and dropping it in one, one go will be a structural column. And that's when we first asked Pierre, who was working on that staircase, is it possible? The structural engineer was sitting there, the quantity surveyor, the cost consultant was sitting there, we were sitting there asking him, and he was looking at us saying, well, you know, and he's, I don't want to characterize all, all of you the same way. <laughs> Pierre's unique. Um, are, you, are you stupid? Can you imagine the, the, the millennia of building that humanity's had? The period of steel and concrete is this, yeah, on the spectrum of construction. Steel and concrete are the untested um, materials. Stone has been used on buildings. Look opposite you, the church is in stone. Okay, yeah, why is it that we are not using it? Structural engineer, we don't get educated in stone. Let me pretend it's unreinforced concrete. All sorts of other criteria we have to meet, but eventually we find out it's structurally capable. He costs it. It's, it's, it has cost advantages. Right, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I won't give you too much history of Clark and Well area. Uh, 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 suffice to say, it's, it's, uh, it was the hotbed of radicalism because it was always, always outside the city walls, but in the post-war period it became incredibly conservative. So that was part of our sort of challenge to that area. We visit the quarries. You've seen this from Pierre, so I won't labor the point. And we discover its natural materials, uh, the natural finishes. Uh, the quarry masters nor tells us normally architects don't come visit quarries. They look at small samples that are brought to them by salespeople saying, would you like it like this or would you like it like that? I said, what happens to this? The quartz and the fossils that you find in the stone. Well, I cut them off. I crush them for aggregate, for road fill because they want clean blocks, clean lines. So we said, okay, forget it. Just, is the, does it cost extra to leave them? Of course not. And leave them. So we, we, we made the decision to leave the finishes, as it were, the quarry master skill, the skill of the, um, the stonemason, and obviously the engineer. As little to do with the architect as possible. So in some respects, uh, a building who's, uh, that is designed by an engineer a stonemason, a quarry master, where the aesthetic is the ultimately their skill and the aesthetic of the material itself. 
Why does it have some rough, some smooth? That's simply because the size of those blocks that come out of the quarry tell you that on the lower part of the building, you'll have columns and beams that are bigger than maybe halfway up. So you slice four of them, so you know there's a, a natural split, a saw cut and a drill. And you don't want wastage, so you have little choice of where those finishes go. You might be able to turn them through 180 degrees, and that's, that's it. This is, I think, uh, 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 Carl alluded to this earlier. This is a, uh, uh, the use of waste. Most stone is actually used for floor tiling. Or, or facade tiling. So a lot of quarries are just cutting tiles out, 10 millimeters, maybe 20 millimeters. It's a great deal of wastage, because obviously not, it doesn't come out 100% perfect. There's a lot of, lot of it breaks. It's just set, sat on the side, not doing much. So we worked with uh, 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 one of Pierre's colleagues, where we took those tiles, and he found a method of bonding them together. And he was, all he was going to do is make them flat to again hang on the walls as facade. And we said, look, if you're bonding them together from scratch, you may as well put them on a piece of formwork that then, once it's bonded, is essentially uh, a, 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 um, a vault. So this was an experiment with using um, um, essentially th uh, 10 millimeter bonded tiles to create those vaults. And since then, we've been developing that and realizing, oh, well, you could actually external finish, internal finish, insulation in the middle, and the two, all three together also become load-bearing. So, it's not, I mean, that's qu quite intensive. Uh, uh, there are less intensive methods, uh, which are just bolting these bits of stone together. So, this is pre-tensioned. Uh, so, we teach and we took our students to Pierre's to, to demonstrate, to try and change that teaching method, as it were, to bring, bring materials in as early as possible. Um, and what we realized was that instead of looking for quarries where you get one giant beam, one giant column at a time, it's far more efficient to get smaller pieces, drill them together, uh, tighten it as pre-tensioned, pre-assemble it in the yard and bring it to, the, bring it to site. And then again, similarly with, um, you know, can we reuse the old technologies of ribs and vaults? And so here, there's um, balloon experiments to reverse those forces and doing precisely the same or pre-tensioning it. This is a, uh, won't be too long, um, uh, a, a tower in central London. It's twice the height of Clerkenwell, built in basalt. So this is before we learned. So once again, one project at a time we're learning, but we're trying to accelerate that now. And this is partly why we're here, to help accelerate it through you guys. Again, one column and beam at a time but we had to use basalt, because basalt performs twice as well in a fire than, than limestone. So you need less of it in volume, extraction, transportation, and time on site. One of the, one of the um, questions we're repeatedly asked in England, because we've, I don't know what it's like over here, but everything is in brick, 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 brick. And uh, I, I do presentations for the RBA with, with other architects who are about to get their awards, and it's all brick, brick, brick. And you ask them, why brick? Why, do you know the embodied carbon of brick? No, I don't. Uh, uh, but I'm thinking of using recycled toilet rolls for bricks. I think, well, that's interesting. Do you know the embodied carbon of recycled toilet rolls? No, I don't. Well, the, the uh, recycling toilet rolls, or just let's call it cardboard, is almost the same carbon uh, uh, as, as brick itself before you manufacture it into a brick form. Yeah? Uh -huh. Now, the thing about it suddenly occurred to me, OK, if you're that addicted to brick, you can't use stone because you, you're imagining stone as giant columns or big blocks. Why don't you just cut the stone to brick size? And then you've got a brick. So we asked some quarries, and uh, it turns out no one's ever asked them before. Uh, I mean, you look at some old buildings, they clearly use them at sort of brick scale. But if you cut them to, to conventional brick size, the embodied carbon is fractional of a, of, a, of, a, of a standard fired clay brick, which is about 550, could be higher depending on the type of brick. And it's exactly the same cost, if not cheaper. So there's no excuse. I mean, I'm not talking to a British audience who are brick obsessed, but there's no excuse, there's no sort of ethical excuse anymore to use fired clay bricks instead of, say, stone brick. And again, other, other challenges. So we were asked to look at a bridge. Surely infrastructure still has to be in steel and concrete. 
and uh, uh, here is um, uh, a bridge, which is meant to be a, a cycle of footprint, but actually it takes road traffic, so it's quite heavy. But it's t totally possible in stone. I think we're almost done. So yes, that's I, th I think that's the embodied carbon of that bridge, which is minus 37. 27? My eyesight's terrible. 27. 27 um, tons. Uh, um, of of CO2, so that's the uh, hopefully the takeaway. It's the embodied carbon as well as the aesthetic and other architectural um, um, um <laughs> criteria you might wish. Same problem. So. Thank you so much for this presentation and thank you for deconstructing all the preconceptions that we may have actually to stone. And I was talking to Thibaut Barreau just before, like bringing stone to the city is actually a matter of the client will uh, to undergo that. It's not a matter of price, it's not a matter of regulations, it's not a matter of uh, difficulty to do it, it's a teamwork. And I was wondering during your presentation, where's the client actually? Who's the client? And uh, was he or she part of that venture to do this project? Was it a difficulty to convince? Well, Clark and Well is our project. That's why um, we, we managed to push it through. And in some respects, you, you know, as an architect, you have to put your money where your, your, you know, your mouth where your money is, your money where your mouth is. Um, so we had to push it through uh, and keep asking those questions. Uh, normally, before then, clients would collapse at the first hurdle where the cost consultant would tell them, I haven't done a, a building in stone before. The last one I heard of was the parliamentary offices where you could have clad the building in top series BMWs and it would have been cheaper. So they're scared of it for cost reasons. Now we've convinced them of not only the engineering and the cost uh, uh, advantages as well as the embodied carbon advantages. You have to triangulate your argument because many clients are entirely cost dependent. They're borrowing money. Uh, um, so you have to tell them about the cost first. The next challenge is what, what project managers will call risk. The risk is there aren't that many stonemasons yet uh, uh, doing this sort of job. And if Pierre gets run over by a bus, <laughs> <laughs> then um, you know the, the the project manager will say, "Aha, Mr. Client, you you're, you're now you know your your project is on hold until we find another Pierre." Or uh, I mean, it's about uh, supply chain risk. Yeah, that's the next challenge. Yeah, I think for um, about your question, it's it's got to be it's something has to come at least from the client. I mean, it's got to be the client first. We want to push a sustainable solution, and um, then he or she is going to build that team with, you know, an architect will line up with that, with his uh, ethos or she's the ethos, um, up down to the project management and construction. We've got to all have the same agenda. Yeah, it's, it's kind of building knowledge also. That's fantastic what you said also, uh, Pierre, about uh, this uh, going back to, to history, to, to learn from the place actually, and to go around the place, uh, to learn from the vernacular, to allow actually to bring back this knowledge into construction. So it's it's about the culture of the client, the culture of a team, how to build that culture through the making. I, I, completely, I, I think we, we have unlearned stone masonry for the last hundred years, because uh, just after the Second World War, you know, we, 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 the, the, the labor force would just disappear, you know, in, 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 into that dreadful um, uh, war. Um, uh, but, but as well, we uh, suddenly concrete becoming a lot more, a lot more cost efficient. Um, you know, requiring, requiring, requiring less um, uh, high, qualifi high qualified uh, labor force. Um, I think we, we very quickly in two generation you can lose uh, uh, knowledge, knowledge for a trade. Yeah. And is it a question of time? Because we see also, I mean, concrete uh, became a main material because of its efficiency in time, you know, in, in building. Is it really a question of time uh, with some well, construction? You know, uh, um, <laughs> hopefully some of you will remember uh, a French architect called Fernand Poulon, who in the post-war period challenged the idea that everything ought to be concrete and steel. 
Uh, and he was winning tenders, wasn't he? Saying, I will do everything in stone. And sure, on tall buildings, the stone becomes the permanent for formwork to concrete behind, but all, pretty much on his low and mid-rise structures, the stone was load-bearing. And that's because he worked out, I could cut stone to a certain size that men could pick up. 25 and, or 30 yeah, centimeters. And, and, think, and assemble yeah. reasonably quickly at low cost. Yeah, so it is a matter actually of just knowledge and building that through. And uh, and you, s you talked about Steve Webb, who is really a genius in uh, you know engineering and thinking about. If I'm not mistaken, maybe you have fighting in uh, with we, we, <laughs> with we, your engineers. Uh, well, <laughs> we, <laughs> those how, how is between it? between <laughs> three of us, we didn't know anything. Uh, uh, well, sorry, I <laughs> should say. We, we had our I learned, you, you we, taught me everything, yeah, yeah. I mean. We, between three of us, we had our specific areas of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and as an architect, I will say nothing <laughs> on stone apart from it's a veneer and not understanding anything about it. Pierre's the one who's, who's spent years being qualified as a, as a stonemason understanding. Of course, you can put buildings up. Steve is a structural engineer who's never been taught in stone, but he understands the structural criteria that's necessary to get it through regulations. So between the three of us, we're challenging that. But yeah, Steve and, and Pierre are doing the principle, meeting what modern regulations, structural regulations, fire regulations, etc., have to do, and meet, making sure the cost is all, um, achieved. I, I, I think it's something that uh, it's not only f uh, about stone, it's more about architecture and construction generally, is that we all have been put into different silos. We all have been put into into the architect, but well, don't care about the material or how it's made. You know, the engineer will do that. The engineer don't care, you know, don't look about how if it's looking good or whatever, just make it work. And the makers at the end of the uh, of the chain just say, okay, well, we're going to make it. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, it's wasteful, um, but yeah, let, let's make it. So I, I think it's, I think we should involve at, at uh, you know, even at student level, you know, mixing between uh, and mixing and, and having young student in architecture talking to young student in engineer talking with with young uh, young trades people and i think that the next generation will be a lot more exciting that's exciting it's really kind of multi-generational yeah. as well it's yeah. not only like you don't build knowledge uh, through or like accumulation but it's kind of an totally. ecosystem that yeah. you're building it's that slide of between Vasari and Winkelmann. Uh, you know, if if we could all learn how to be structural engineers and architects and stonemasons at the same time, if that was possible, that would be the ideal. Um, in the meantime, it's good just to communicate on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm just thinking. I, I remember meeting you in London actually uh, during an exhibition I was participating in, and uh, Pierre appears the apostle actually of uh, of a stone of Pierre, and and suddenly directly there is a Steve, and then we, we should meet uh, I mean, So it's really fantastic this kind of uh, a three uh, or like multidisciplinary approach yes. approach to the to the material itself, and I'm also wondering like going back to engineering, uh, are there any different tools of calculation of the uh, of the strength of the stone because i know that all the engineers today or the the, the uh, what we have as tools are based on concrete. I know there are lots of also engineers working on that, Bollinger and Grauman. Uh, how much is it easy actually to, to push the, the tools of calculation? Yeah, I, I think that's the, the that one of the hidden, hidden um, beauty of it is that uh, engineering is key on all the structure we are making. Uh, they required a lot of uh, new knowledge about software, uh, analyzing analyzing structures with the software. But um, it, it means as well that's the, the, the what's great with Steve and his team is that th you must have some critical thinking and just just not relying on the machine, and 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 have your your good basic in in physics in in and and so on. And I, I think it's. Um, uh, we, we, the the, logic, the 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 software are fantastic to speed up that process and and to make sure that this structure is going to stand up, but uh, you should see the amount of mock-up we are doing. You know, the, the specific uh, testing for for just to test just to test if these connections are working, if if uh, if it's going to be we behave well as well. So there is all a research part that that is key, and. I think that you know the engineer that are here will know very well that you know one of the best things that an engineer can do is take something away 
or out of your building to make it to make it even more efficient you know and we have lost that stonemason even you architect at some point is just to always add things to uh, to res to solve a problem when you should take off things you know it's the you, as the great engineer used to say you know you add lightness uh, to your building that's something we saw on your uh, like a table where we see the carbon footprint and we can notice actually that many of the materials above concrete are used in concrete construction because you have steel, you have then the cladding and then you have all these layers that add up and that's yeah. what's fascinating in yeah. your building. Uh, We're just Absolutely, I mean that's, that's um, I don't want to over labor um, and keep blaming Winkelmann, but his his <laughs> his idea was that uh, uh, really it's the appearance, the the two dimensional external as well as internal appearance. As long as it's Greek, and that was his idea at the time, uh, it's the appearance that matters most. And teaching from then on, especially in England, literally within a few years of him saying that, became neoclassical. No more all the all the academicians who were. The stonemasons and bricklayers and carpenters originally, before they be graduated to become masters of architecture, said no more of that. From now on, you're just drawing, 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 drawing. Innovations, one generation after another, came through drawings until you arguably the modern period, modernist period of steel and innovations of steel and glass, and then the, its conflated appearance. Um, uh, uh, allows us to think that we can create beautiful drawings. And, um, well, how is that held up? I mean, that's the bizarre thing. You look at brick buildings in the UK now because the fashion is all brick, and brick seems to magically fly across windows in, in stretcher bond. There's no lintel of any description, not even a pretend brick lintel. It's because architects are no longer, um, uh, you know, these are some of, dare I say, some of them, I'm not allowed to say it because I'm not there at the moment. <laughs> some of the, uh, the most lauded and uh, uh, awarded architects uh, and you ask them, well, 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 I don't need to. You know, I, I hand it over to a structural engineer or a contractor. The contractor has got some product that he's holding up the brick with or the stone, layer upon layer, because I'm just interested in the skin as opposed to putting my hand through the building and saying, well, actually, the, the ethical happens, position yeah. should be you're interested in all of it yeah. as well as its three-dimensional and atmospheric qualities and textural narrative qualities. Yeah, there's a sense of truthfulness, actually, in the material and the, in the construction and then accessibility to that construction. The sense, even if I'm not an architect, I would be able to, you know, to understand yeah. and uh, yeah. touch how this building has been put together. Uh, yeah. That, that is, the, the same question comes up every generation. So yeah. immediately after the neoclassical period, we have a, a 19th century modern period, as it were, where... Uh, Gottfried Semper and Karl Bertica are asking exactly that. What is the, um, it's the tectonics, so they, they, they um, term the tectonics, uh, the, the joining, binding, and completion of materials, structural materials, to then become culturally emblematic. Very quickly forgotten because it just becomes an image again, and it's re reproducing the image without understanding how you join, bind, and complete materials. But you're right, you, you make a building irreducible. Mm -hmm. The structure is effectively the finish that you're looking at. And if you're ever challenged to say, well, can you take this layer off? Well, I can, and then the building will fall down. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you make your building irreducible and quickly find mm -hmm. there's a lot less materials, a lot less ingredients, mm -hmm. and um, you've, you've hopefully made it, as you say. You, you, you hit a number of levels, including its cost and embodied carbon. Yeah. And also what's fantastic is to see that uh, there's a new or another way to look at material, that it's not about the cleanliness or like the, the, the finish of, uh, of, the, of the stone, is accepting actually the process, accepting the, the hand, the tool, uh, the, the, the strangling of the, of the stone, the cutting, the violence that had been underlaying the, the, the process of it and making that visible and giving new aesthetics through that in the city. But, but I, I think, you know, there is beauty in brutality. I'm sorry to say that, it's a yeah. bit uh, hard. But <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a certain beauty to brutality. And um, I think when we speak with, with Frédéric, uh, uh, Frédéric often say, you know, uh, architecture is violent in a way. You know, you've got, you've got to dig, you've got to cut, you've got to, to, uh, to crush. You know, it's, it's a very you know, powerful uh, experience. It's, uh, and um, I, I think the beauty of, um, 
of some of the buildings that are built at the moment in France as well. It's, it's, it's this honesty of the material uh, that was, of course, Fernand Pouillon, uh, one of the tenants of Fernand Pouillon, uh, that was the, just leave it as it was, you know, just why will you add again something to, to, the, to the stone? Let, let it be, let it age. Um, and yeah, I think this over, uh, this over polishing, this over honing of, of things is, is detrimental to stone. Uh, because nothing more, be more beautiful than a, a piece of granite left row or just split rather than polished to death and finishing as a tombstone usually. Um, which, which, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. It's, um, yeah. And how did people react to that? How did Londoners actually react to such a building that's not in brick, that doesn't, you know? Follow the well, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, that's that's part of the issue, isn't it? That we define ultimately, we define architecture. Uh, I mean, it's uh, yeah, that you know, you end up, I mean, to answer your question, uh, badly. <laughs> One of our one of our local Sorry, pol yeah, <laughs> one of our local politicians tried to have it demolished. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I won't wow. spend too much time on it, but after two years, what we discovered on the inquiry and the planning inquiry was actually he'd ordered somebody in the um, enforcement department to go to the planning department, take our drawings, they'd all been stamped, approved, oh yeah, yeah, and take them away, hide them, yeah, and then pretend it never had approval so you could then demolish it. <laughs> he had something he's personal. Still a, he's, still a, he's still in a job. <laughs> he haven't so, met so you. So is yeah. the guy who's in the enforcement department because the inquiry is specifically about did this building ever have permission? And when the drawings, he had to swear an oath. Yeah. And uh, if you if you lie, you you're in prison for six years. Uh, so all the drawings went back, and you know we got. But uh, he's. I know that's politicians for you. I don't know how they managed to maneuver themselves, but he's still in a job. <laughs> Uh, but we asked the question, how is it that this uh, politician has decided personally, you know, he's obviously got the power to do so, that in his, defi his definition of architecture, this is ugly, yeah? This is concrete. It's some sort of brutalist concrete thing. And then when somebody told him, no, it's stone, uh, it's pretend stone. And I said, what does that mean? It's been cast to look like stone, but there are fossils in it. The fossils, anyway, the, the, he went on and on, and you think, Somewhere along the line, culturally, we've defined architecture just as clearly, aesthetically, as this two-dimensional thing. It must look like something, whether it's something that we're used to from the past or, or even conventional, something that becomes conventional that's new. But it's the skin of the building, the appearance of the building, and any innovation in the materials themselves, the tectonics, understanding those tectonics, is, is, is not understood. And why is that? And then you come back to this argument between the process and the product and the process allows understanding the process allows innovation a broader understanding uh, you know I could expand I always try to think of analogies when I'm talking to lay audiences who aren't architects and I keep and this is probably the you, the best audience to speak to and again I, I apologize for my generalization but you might be able to help me refine that um, analogy but I keep trying to use cooking as an analogy or making yeah. making pastry or bread that, yeah, that you, you you have the basic ingredients so in the UK we invented something called the Chorley wood bre bread making method so during the war you know our, uh, we all, all the boats were being torpedoed so what we discovered is that you, the little wheat you had that we couldn't grow particularly with much protein in it if you mixed it with pig fat uh, and you didn't have much yeast either. <laughs> you didn't need to wait for it to rise. You could just put it in the oven and the pig fat would expand and there'd be nice little holes in it and you'd get some pig fat as well as um, bread, wheat. Yeah. In the post-war period, it got more and more ingredients until now it's so highly processed. It's called bread, but it's got you know something like 20, 30 ingredients in it to be processed as opposed to just wheat, f flour and water and maybe a little bit of salt. Yeah. Uh, and what we've got to got used to as a culture, not just as architects, but broadly as a culture, is understanding architecture as these vast amounts of processed ingredients that they don't need to be. Yeah? And w so that's that's where I think the problem is in yes. terms of perception, yeah. and therefore how we produce. Yeah. 
Go so, ahead. Sorry, just, we we uh, conclude with you, uh, Pierre. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's again, it's about cooking. Yes. Um, <laughs> what, what's funny is that we, we had a couple of Italian architects coming at the uh, at the at the at the workshop, working for for big uh, central uh, architect uh, practice, and they 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 were explaining. You know, we are fed up of this sort of. Uh, uh, and coming from an Italian, it was an insult of this. Uh, uh, Big Mac layering of facade, you know, these layers of material that just layers and layers and, and say, you know, it's not architecture. And I said, you know, with, with our um, way of putting stone together, pre-assembled, we are doing a sort of kebab. And uh, <laughs> I, if we had more time, I would have attacked that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's so, finish with you know, that. from bread <laughs> to kebab to, uh, to uh, uh, from bread to kebab uh, uh, to Big Mac, I think we just need to rethink about our building, about like eating well, you know, just having yes, healthy yes, buildings. It's a fantastic yeah. uh, parallel between our bodies, what we eat, our environment that dress us. Thank you so much, uh, Emil and Pierre. Uh, Thank you. This, uh, Thank you for the invitation. Let's continue with Philippe Ram, an architect who will talk about architecture and weather to open our avenues to look at the development of uh, materials and to talk about uh, stone as well, of course. You have the floor, Philippe. Thank you very much for your invitation. First of all, I would like to offer a general introduction on the uh, weather context, uh, and then I will come back uh, to different projects we've, we've worked on. I will show also how climate uh, uh, has, uh, has to be factored in architecture. I will use this uh, book, The Natural History of Architecture, that we presented here at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal three years ago. We were fortunate to present it. Then this exhibition is currently showing in Lyon. So first of all, what I would like to show you is the current situation, which is uh, climate warming, global warming. Here we see a variation of temperature in temperature, and we see the current crisis where we have temperature which, increase, which has increased by four uh, degrees. We've never experienced that in human history. There are many changes uh, uh, happening. Two major changes are needed to fight against climate change, to mitigate the emission of CO2, and second, to adapt cities and buildings to this increase in temperature. So this is another aspect which is interesting, the quantity of energy which is available to humans. So uh, first they have their first muscles, the muscles of animals, then of mills, and then you have slavery. And then on the graph, we see that coal, fossil fuels, gave a lot of energy to humans. And therefore, we were able to uh, uh, contemplate a, a new type of architecture, which was very different from the Middle Ages. You can have uh, skyscrapers with steel, with concrete, which uh, need a lot of energy to be produced when stone uh, structures, stone buildings, need less energy. So this is a global mean surface temperature graph from the 1880s when we started using coal for steam, steam machines and the continuation of that. You see the rate of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, increasing. It was hard to draw a parallel between these two uh, things, but uh, from the 1950s, we saw that the level of CO2 was opaque to infrared. And what was happening before the 19th century, you have the sun uh, rays hitting the earth, which heats and then re-emits infrareds with CO2 emissions, 
which are increasing in the atmosphere. You have this greenhouse effect. The, uh, the earth is uh, warming uh, increasingly. So it's interesting to see that. That's a curve showing the, the spectrum of uh, energy entering the earth. You see on the top, uh, uh, the top of the atmosphere and then below it's the level of it's the sea level and this is the infrared spectrum we see 15 microns per meter and we see the infrareds emitted by the the earth and this heat is em emitted emitted at night and this is the uh, uh, absorption the co2 absorption uh, spectrum but it becomes opaque, around 10 microns. Uh, and when you uh, um, uh, superimpose the two, you see the effect uh, it has on the climate and global warming. So when we ask ourselves who is, in, who is responsible for those CO2 emissions, we know that the building uh, sector uh, uh, is uh, largely responsible for these emissions, uh, more than 30%. 39% in fact, then we see the annual global building sector CO2 emission in 2017 for this graph. Uh, one quarter of emissions is the carbon footprint, whether you build with stone or with concrete, so that's one quarter of the problem, and three quarters of the problem is the heating of buildings. So when uh, we became aware of global warming in the 1990s. Architects uh, tried to mitigate energy consumption. We talked about ventilation, uh, uh, insulation. This is a very interesting study which shows uh, in dark uh, pink, you see the energy coming from heating and the lighter uh, pink is from material, construction materials. Since efforts have been made, we had nine centimeters of uh, thermal insulation in France. We've moved on to 25 centimeters. So we see that we have a better uh, insulation. And this is a way to reduce uh, energy consumption for the construction sector. But as long as we don't insulate buildings properly, the carbon imprint of material is only one quarter of the problem. So this is why today, uh, in the Canton de Vaud in Switzerland, uh, first of all, it was the issue of energy consumption uh, uh, on which we focused uh, uh, the issue. And today, we've solved this and we've reached, uh, we've solved half of the problem. And the Canton de Vaud no longer wants to build with uh, um, concrete, but with stone or other materials to uh, remove that part of the problem, that percentage of the problem. So there's the issue of the carbon imprint, and the three quarters I'm, I've been focusing on uh, uh, for a long time. This is. Uh, uh, energy consumption, so this was the situation before, uh, which is changing now, where we were burning uh, fossil fuels for heating, this would emit CO2, leading to global warming, then we moved on to renewable energies to no longer emit CO2, but this energy transition is uh, slow. Um, 85% uh, um, of the, the energy emitting greenhouse gases uh, are, are, are related to this. So here we have the amount of energy when you have a, uh, that is emitted when you have a, a building which is not well insulated and the, uh, the amount of megajoules can be uh, reduced when uh, the building is better insulated. So here you have a 25 centimeter insulation, uh, air tightness uh, in the building. If in the winter I open my windows to remove humidity or change the air, a lot of cold air comes in and then I have to reheat that cold 
air and then we lose a lot of energy before we need to we need we used to uh, use a double flow ventilation now we use uh, co2 uh, uh, sequestr uh, sequestr sequestr sorry sequestration um, devices co2 capture devices uh, i'm often uh, um, i often hear this this idea that Stone uh, is a, is a not a good material in terms of insulation, and that's not true. If you uh, do the calculation, 20 centimeter of uh, uh, thermal insulation corresponds to uh, a wall of stone that uh, uh, is of nine meters. So nine meters of stone. That's uh, uh, a lot. So from an energy point of view, it's not very interesting. But uh, in terms of inertia, it can be interested in the summer, but in s inside uh, thermal insulation. So you have a, a, a stone building with visible stone. Uh, uh, this, if, if you have stone inside of the uh, thermal insulation, then it's interesting. So these are all the projects now in which we've uh, used uh, stone. So uh, the VA, the French design uh, uh, project, uh, um, wanted to question uh, the double flow ventilation systems, energy issues within buildings. And here, the, the result, this is an interior design rather, and it was a, a way to criticize postmodernism in the 1980s, 1990s. We would see stone in, in, in Paris, but it was stone uh, cramped uh, in front of the building, so visually it looked like uh, uh, the uh, Paris white uh, uh, limestone, but in fact the stone was falling on to, following, uh, falling on uh, um, uh, bystanders uh, uh, because it wasn't uh, cramped properly so it was just visual it didn't have any other inner qualities it was just for appearance a post structuralist period where the architecture was uh, more about storytelling and we wanted to uh, uh, look at stone differently to use stone not as a visual element but to use it as uh, well inside of a building in a physiological manner so we had this floor heating in stone using the stone from the pa paris basin with the type of stone you had in that basin so you have a geological aspect to re-naturalize the inner space uh, uh, of a building so uh, the outside of the building is heated by uh, human induced activity so it's kind of artificial but can we recreate nature inside of the building and that's what we did by using a wood and, and, and stone uh, inside but it was sort of chemical uh, chemically induced the air uh, inside wa was using wa was fragranced with uh, paris stone the use of uh, paris stone there was heating uh, uh, drawing uh, its inspiration from different types of uh, geology uh, stone geology uh, and that was inside of the building Cette, ces différentes couches, comme ça. So you see the different layers here. And from that project, you have a, a typical type, type of Paris lighting, a particular type of lamp used here. Là, euh, en fait, on avait continué cette idée. We continued with that idea of uh, the presence of a, geology, a geological presence inside of the building, uh, looking at this double flow, dual flow ventilation system. When we talked about the renewal of uh, the uh, indoor air and that it was important, could it be uh, an architectural 
focus to study ventilation, the ventilation system, we thought that would be the, the main topic of the project here. So in this project, we decided to use, uh, to look at the air inlet and to uh, increase the ventilation duct to, to have the corridor, or to make the corridor of the building. And we used the different stones that could be found. The, the, the wind comes from uh, the west and we used those different stones with a ventilation tube using these different uh, parts of stones uh, uh, crossing the building uh, and which fragrance would uh, um, penetrate the building with um, limestone, for instance. And this, so this ventilation, and this would lead to the ventilation duct. So the air uh, uh, uses the corridor, it is distributed in all of the rooms and then it is recovered with this double dual flow ventilation system. So the air coming inside uh, of the building uses the corridor, becomes a corridor itself. So here you have the, the blueprint of this stone corridor, everything is in stone and the air circulating uh, indoors in this way. Alors on va rentrer à l'intérieur comme ça du mur de ce voilà là on est à l'intérieur donc de ce cette So here we are inside of this ventilation system which has become a corridor um, it is built with different types of stones uh, indoors Alors là, un autre, euh, un autre usage de la pierre, qui est un, un projet plus récent. Ok, c'est un autre usage de la pierre, qui est probablement plus intéressant. Dans le premier projet, la pierre avait une autre dimension. Ici, c'est une approche plus physiologique, parce que nous regardons la pierre et le problème de l'effusion. Parce que dans les églises, dans le passé, en Italie, when they were building churches, they were using marble for cooling purposes. And Violet Le Duc visited St. Peter's in, in Rome and it talked about the selection of the stone because it was cold and cool. And he says, well, that's a wonderful idea because in this uh, warm Mediterranean setting, the church, is kind of a climate refuge and you can seek refuge in churches when you're too hot in your homes. And that's kind of the relationship there may be between public space and climate qualities. These are values that we sort of lost in the 20th century because then the public space uh, was seen for its social dimension, but we forgot about the climate dimension of public spaces. Like in France, for instance, in the past, people came in bars and cafes in the winter time to be warm because uh, some people could not afford to warm their homes. And in Italy, people went to churches to have a cool temperature in the summertime. That's an illustration of the exhibition at Arsenal here in this very building and you see the different type of uh, public spaces used for cooling purposes. This is a um, project that we were awarded for the um, radio building in Paris. In the middle you have uh, live shows, a theatre, a, uh, a, a bookshop, a cafe, and we started from the cafe and we thought, okay, what's the right positioning of the cafe? So we analyzed the sun. We saw that in, in red, you have lots of sun. In blue, you have little sun. So we thought, okay, in the summertime, it's going to be nice to be in the shade. Whereas in the wintertime, it's going to be nice to be in 
the sunlight. So there is no one perfect location for the cafe, but there are there is a gradation of places. So then we turn this into shapes, and these shapes are then combined with some types of materials, and we talk about effusive effusivity. So when you are, and you start from high value of effusivity to low value of effusivity, and you see that some materials have a genuine cooling effect and others won't, like wool, for instance. So we have a gradation of materials between the materials with low effusivity, wool for the winter time, and then you have wood, rubber, granite, granite and metal, which are distributed uh, in this venue depending on the level of sunlight presence. So where it's very cold with no sun, you combine this with metal, so these places are very nice in the summer place, in the summertime. And the entire public space is organized like, that, like this. This is the part in wool where you get a warming effect and you see that the uh, chairs also avoid drafts. Then you move to wood and then you move to stone with chairs which uh, allow for draft to circulate so that you can get a cooling effect and it goes all the way to metal in the coolest parts of the building. So to me, that's also a way to rehabilitate materials and have them outside their metaphoric and symbolic um, dimension. Stone becomes um, supporting material and with a thermal characteristics as it had in the past before fossil fuels. These, this is a, a, another excerpt from a book called Natural History, and it shows that if we build in wood and straw and see it as a progress, it's also because we have less energy, because our living conditions are changing, we no longer live in the era of abundance of energy, and we are back to uh, a, a more sober use of energy, like in the Middle Ages, not because we no longer have ideas as architects, but because the uh, conditions are not there anymore. We are not deciding on the aesthetics of all this, we architects, but we have to abide by the context around us. If we have lots of oil, we build skyscrapers. If we don't, we build houses in stone and timber. So that's New York before fossil fuels and New York, sorry, New York after. That's New York before and after oil. And you see that coal and oil has decided, uh, has made a decision with regards to the height of the building, not the architect. Another interesting thing when it comes to understanding architecture and stone. That's because, and it's also linked to geology. It's interesting to look at this Palladio house from the Renaissance. Uh, it was um, presented to me as a very esoteric uh, building with the golden number and everything. But when you read Palladio, he explains the house as a climate uh, house or a climate protection house. The rotonda, the round room, room, is the coolest in the house. And to achieve that, the architect looked at the Pantheon in Rome that was rediscovered. 
and the Pantheon has a convection system which is built in. You have a hall at the top and just like in a steam co cooker when uh, pressure goes up, you have to open it and allow the hot air to exit. And this is why all these Duomos were not built for prestige, for prestige reasons. They were built to create a ventilation system. And Palladio had built this house with drafts coming in the basement, getting with air getting cooler in these parts. And then you had the air, cool air that was exited in the lower part of the, of the house. So you have this house which is still cool in the summertime. The bluestone here allows exiting or circulating cool air and you see that hot air is evacuated. We took inspiration from that in a competitive project in Switzerland, in Lausanne. Our project is a small building to the right. We tried to uh, contain the footprint of the building. We have uh, solar panels on the roof. That was mandatory. But for the building, what we did was that we worked on the building with uh, ventilation, natural ventilation in the spring where uh, air enters uh, through the windows and exits at the top, like in Palladio's building. But for the winter time, what we do is that we extract air through thermal chimneys. Then we go to the basement to have geothermal cooling. And all this is blown inside the building. So just like for the first project, where we enlarged the ventilation tower, we have the same idea here, but we don't have the ventilation sheath that bring in the, new, the, the fresh air. It's the whole building that becomes that. And the ventilation system captures the uh, used air. And the building is built in different layers between the cool basement layers and the upper warm layers a bit like in a greenhouse. And for the lower part, at the, at the bottom, what we call the frigidarium, what we used as an example was the Marie-Antoinette's uh, milking parlor um, in Versailles, which was used to, to keep the milk. And Everything there is made to cool the atmosphere. The hot air is evacuated through the roof. Everything is white. Napoleon changed um, flooring with uh, red tiles. But before that, everything was white, not to reflect the heat from the sun. And then you have this large grotto that's used to cool the room during the night. And the freshness collected during the night is then distributed in the milking parlor all through the day. And you have all these um, evaporation systems inspired by the works of the Arabs in Morocco or Spain that help decrease the temperature. So it's a refrigeration system from before fossil fuels. And that was our inspiration to design the um, basement of the building. So you see that we're very close to the lake and the water table is very close. So we digged down three meters and then we go below the water table. The principle being to keep this closed in the winter time so that it remains uh, uh, dry. But in the summertime, the basement is flooded with the water from the water table. 
and then the system becomes like a big nargile, <laughs> so uh, or a big big pipe, and uh, you bring the air in the basement. It's cooled in the basement, and then goes back up. And all the floors in the middle are drilled with holes, like in Palladio's uh, drilled stones. So the air goes through, and these floors get closer to one another in order to capture hot air as it goes up. And you see ventilation. And with the engineers, we calculated that we could uh, superheat the high chimney that uh, actuates the entire ventilation system, which is actuated thanks to the overpressure in the exit chimney. And then at the bottom, we have a grotto. At the top, we have a greenhouse. And these are the two climate ref refuge, so to speak, one for the winter time, the other one for the summer time. And of course, we worked around the principles of effusivity. So here you see this grotto that also becomes a public space, likewise for the uh, greenhouse. And you see the center where you can walk and the building becomes a huge ventilation system that uh, becomes more narrow as it goes up. And you see the structure in stone at the base, uh, at the bottom and in timber at the top of the building. And these are two pictures showing you the flooring with drills, which is drilled to let the air go through for ventilation purposes. And I'd like to finish with this project on which we're currently working. The idea being to have two poles, a grotto to the north and a greenhouse at the top. They become public spaces these are the ideas of the uh, 18th century cafe. That's uh, the place where people go to, to, to warm up and where people can meet. Um, so we have these two poles. And the factory extends between these two poles. So these are places where we produce air. The air goes through these two poles and, air, and then is blown uh, in the factory and in the office building. So you see the hot part that provides heating in the winter time, the uh, cool part that provides uh, air conditioning facilities in the summertime. In the summertime, you overheat thanks to the greenhouse. That's geothermal per, uh, principles. You have the hot air that circulated in dual flows and that, that's then exited. And these are a few pictures to show you how all this is organized. And the cold place that uses the same principles. It's here to the north. It goes down in the basement with a grotto with an inertia system that allows cooling the air for the summertime. And this uh, cooler air is, uh, is then blown in the factory and in the office spaces. OK, and this is the factory. And all the office spaces are arranged along the ventilation system. And that's it. Thank you um, to all of you. Enjoy the weekend, and we hope to see you again for the next matinale uh, on the 13th of May, again a Saturday.